Capturing the Smallest Animal in the World by Leon Augustus Hausmann, Ph.D. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Abai in January 2018. Capturing the Smallest Animal in the World by Leon Augustus Hausmann, Ph.D. From Popular Mechanics, Volume 37, January 1922. We have become a bit blasé during recent years to accounts of animals of prehistoric existence whose dimensions dwarfed those of our present animal forms. Possibly, then, our wearied enthusiasm for the unusual in zoology may be revived by a report of the capture and study of a creature which, in size, stands at the other extreme from the titanic dinosaurs of yore. The smallest speck which can be detected by the average unaided eye is a bit of opaque white substance, about 50 microns, 0 0.002 inches in diameter, seen against the black background. But the creature here under consideration is only one twenty-fifth of this size. A graphic idea of its extreme smallness can be had by comparing it with the ordinary human hair. In figure 2 is shown this, the smallest animal in existence, compared with a human hair, ordinarily averaging 50 microns in diameter. This diminutive creature, however, rejoices in a name which yields nothing in length and impressiveness to the appellations borne by the mightiest dinosaur science has to offer, for it trails after it the resounding cognomen of Pleuromonas jaculans. In diameter, along the longest axis, its body rarely reaches a length of 8 or 9 microns, about 1 three thousandth of an inch, and the writer has often found individuals as small as 2 microns, 1 twelve thousandth of an inch. Figure 1 shows three typical individuals. The body is somewhat the shape of a kidney bean, with two long whip-like threads extending from a depression in one side. With these whips, known as flagellums, the creature makes its rather jerky way through the water in search of food, for it lives in pools and ponds amid decaying vegetation, where an ample supply of bacteria and juices from the disintegrating plant tissue is always present. These serve as its food, which is absorbed into the soft jelly-like area at the base of the flagellums. The life of a single individual is usually but a few hours. At the end of that time, the creature simply divides into two new individuals, both of which swim away, feed, and increase in size, and then themselves divide, and so on. In figure 3 is shown an unusual photograph of this most minute animal form of which we have record, magnified many thousand times. The capture of Pleuromonas, while not involving any of the risk to life and limb which attends the capture of our largest living animal forms, the whales, still involves as great time, patience and perseverance on the part of the hunter. In figure 5 is shown the apparatus devised by the author for the capture of the protozoa, the first great division of animals to which Pleuromonas belongs, under the microscope. By skillful manipulation of the tip of the pipette under the objective of the microscope, it is possible to secure single individuals of Pleuromonas and to transfer them either to glass microscope slides or to sterilized culture jars to breed a new race. And many failures, either to capture or to transfer these tiny animals from one place to another, is the lot of the hunter after the smallest animal in existence. Pleuromonas claims our interest, not only because it is the most minute form of animal life known to exist on our earth today, but because it is of actual economic value to us as well. Often, bodies of water filled with putrefying plant remains will be colored a milky hue by the immense numbers of these tiny creatures, each one of which is a valuable scavenger, 
helping to transform decaying vegetable tissue into animal substance. The pleuromonas are devoured in their turn by larger forms of the protozoa, or single-celled animals, which again are eaten by minute crustacea and insects. And these last constitute one of the most important supplies of fish food. In many cases, therefore, these tiniest of nature's children are the ones to take the first step in the great work of making many of our waterways sweet and pure. End of Capturing the Smallest Animal in the World by Leon Augustus Hausmann, Ph.D. Discovery of Printing from the American Printer by Thomas McKellar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The credit of inventing the art which perpetuates the history and achievements of all the arts and sciences has been obstinately contested, several cities having advanced rival claims to the honor of the discovery. This, however, should be no matter of surprise when we consider that the inventor of a new art, unprotected by law, would naturally endeavor to conceal its processes for his own use and advantage. After due consideration, we agree with Isaiah Thomas in the opinion that the probabilities point to Laurentius, sometimes called Coster, Coster, and Custos, as the discoverer of the art of printing. Laurentius lived at Harlem and was a man of property. He seems to have been engaged in printing books from woodblocks or plates, well known to antiquaries as the block books, in which the reading matter was illustrated by rude pictures. Fragments of works so printed by him are still in existence. Among others, the celebrated Biblia Pau Perum, executed between 1410 and 1420, has been attributed to him, it was only natural that his thoughts should be led to the production of single types as a means of cheapening and facilitating his work these were first made of wood and afterward of tin the date of his invention of separate types is given as about the year fourteen twenty nine other dates have been stated ranging from fourteen twenty two to fourteen thirty six the first of his printed books, it is claimed, was the Speculum Humane Salvationis, of which about ten copies are now known to be in existence. A small primer, or abacadarium, in our opinion, shows all the marks of the first attempt of an experimenter in a new art. Coaster died in 1439. The necessity for employing workmen to assist in prosecuting the art led to the divulging of the secret. Among these men, it is supposed, was John Geinsfleisch, or Gutenberg Sr., who, after learning the processes, returned to Mentz, his native place, and communicated the secret to his nephew, John Gutenberg, an ingenious artist of Strasbourg. It is in evidence that the latter, in conjunction with two partners, spent a considerable amount of money in some private experiments. These appear to have occupied several years, from 1436 to 1439, when a legal contest arose as to the rights of one of the partners, whose zealous activity had caused his death. Gutenberg continued at Strasbourg till 1444, when his means being exhausted, he rejoined his uncle at Mentz. Here he renewed his experiments, and needing money, he procured an introduction to John Fust, a capitalist and moneylender, who seems to have been struck with the importance of the work and who advanced a considerable amount, all the tools and presses being pledged as security, in furtherance of the enterprise. Two years were occupied in making the types and necessary machinery, when the great work of printing the Bible was begun. There can be little doubt that, during all his years of experiment, Gutenberg had executed smaller books, one of which is surmised to have been a reproduction of the Dutch Speculum of Coster, the Donatus of 1451, the Appeal Against the Turks of 1454, and the Letters of Indulgence of 1454 and 1455, all appear before the Bible, which was not published until 1455 or 1456. This great book marked an era in the art. 
it is painful to be told that about this time Fust foreclosed the mortgage and the entire work with all the materials passed into his possession it seems however that gutenberg succeeded in re-establishing a press and continued to practice the art but produced no work at all comparable with the bible he died about fourteen sixty eight after securing possession of the establishment fust engaged the service of peter schoeffer who had been apprentice or assistant to gutenberg and who was distinguished for scholarship as well as mechanical skill his skill and the improvements made by him in the art soon led fust to take him into partnership and the bible the psalter and other important works were produced schoeffer was further rewarded by the hand of the granddaughter of fust from this rapid summary we may conclude one that the merit of the invention of printing however rude it may have been belongs to coaster of harlem two that gutenberg placed the art on a permanent foundation and three that its economical application was ensured by peter schoeffer's invention of cast metal types it was of course impossible to conceal the knowledge of an art so useful to man and within ten years after the publication of the great bible presses were established in several german cities in rome and other parts of italy and soon thereafter in france and england william caxton acquired a knowledge of the art in germany and carried it into practice at westminster in england the year fourteen seventy seven is now accepted as the date of the introduction the first book printed with a date in england being the deked and sayings of the philosophers imprinted by me william caxton at westminster the year of our lord one thousand four hundred seventy seven he had previously printed without a date the recule of the history of troy which was followed by the game and play of the chess finished the last day of march the year of our lord god a thousand four hundred and seventy four these were however printed at bruges so according to mr william blades the first indisputable date we have to stand on is the printing of the deke in fourteen seventy seven though at that time over sixty years old caxton was notable for his industrious habit he was possessed of good sense and sound judgment steady persevering active zealous and liberal in his devices for that important art which he introduced into england laboring not only as a printer but as a translator and author the productions of his press amount to sixty four in the church warden's book of st margaret's parish westminster his death is thus recorded fourteen ninety one item at burying of william caxton for four torches six shillings eight pence item for the bell at same burying six pence the bible was printed in spanish at valencia in fourteen seventy nine by lambert palmert a german but so completely was it afterwards suppressed by the inquisition that only four leaves now remain in the archives of valencia the first hebrew bible ever printed came from the press of abraham colorito at sonsino in fourteen eighty eight a very remarkable work iceland had its printing office in fifteen thirty at which a bible was printed in fifteen eighty four end of discovery of printing from the American Printer by Thomas MacKellar, read by Phil Schempf. Equal Rights in the Lecture Room Letter to the Committee of the New Bedford Lyceum, November 29, 1845 By Charles Sumner, 1811 to 1874 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. After accepting an invitation to lecture at the Lyceum at New Bedford, Mr. Sumner, learning that colored persons were denied membership and equal opportunities with white persons, refused to lecture, as appears in the following letter, which was published in the paper of the time shortly afterwards the obnoxious rule was rescinded and mr sumner lectured boston november twenty nine eighteen forty five my dear sir 
i have received your favor of november twenty four asking me to appoint an evening in february or march to lecture before the new bedford lyceum in pursuance of my promise on receiving the invitation of your lyceum i felt flattered and in undertaking to deliver a lecture at some time to be appointed afterwards i promised myself particular pleasure in an occasion of visiting a town which i had never seen but whose refined hospitality and liberal spirit as described to me awakened my warmest interest since then i have read in the public prints a protest purporting to be by a gentleman known to me by reputation who are members of the lyceum and some of them part of its government from which it appears that in former years tickets of admission were freely sold to colored persons as to white persons and that no objection was made to them as members but that at the present time tickets are refused to colored persons and membership is also refused practically though by special vote recently adopted they are allowed to attend the lectures without expense provided they will sit in the north gallery from these facts it appears that the new bedford lyceum has undertaken within its jurisdiction to establish a distinction of caste not recognized before one of the cardinal truths of religion and freedom is the equality and brotherhood of man in the sight of god and of all just institutions the white man can claim no precedence or exclusive privilege from his color it is the accident of an accident that places a human soul beneath the dark shelter of an african countenance rather than beneath our colder complexion nor can i conceive any application of the divine injunction do unto others as you would have them do unto you more pertinent than to the man who founds a discrimination between his fellow-men on difference of skin it is well known that the prejudice of color which is akin to the stern and selfish spirit that holds a fellow-man in slavery is peculiar to our country it does not exist in other civilized countries in france colored youths at college have gained the highest honors and been welcomed as if they were white at the law school there i have sat with them on the same benches in italy i have seen an abyssinian mingling with monks and there was no apparent suspicion on either side of anything open to question all this was christian so it seemed to me in lecturing before a lyceum which has introduced the prejudice of color amongst its laws and thus formally reversed an injunction of highest morals and politics i might seem to sanction what is most alien to my soul and join in disobedience to that command which teaches that the children of earth are all of one blood i cannot do this i beg therefore to be excused at present from appointing a day to lecture before your lyceum and i pray you to lay this letter before the lyceum that the ground may be understood on which i deem it my duty to decline the honor of appearing before them i hope you will pardon the frankness of this communication and believe me my dear sir very faithfully yours charles sumner to the chairman of the committee of the bedford lyceum end of equal rights in the lecture room by charles sumner 1811 to 1874george hegel's psychology from hegel as the national philosopher of germany published in 1874 by dr karl rosenkrantz 1805 to 1879 translated by granville stanley hall 1846 to 1924 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the presupposition for hegel's philosophy of right of the state and of history was not as is commonly said his logic alone but no less his psychology 
since locke's philosophy psychology has become properly a central science to which investigation was directed with special predilection and proceeding from which it was attempted to ground the other sciences ethics ascetics and religious doctrine in this the germans had accomplished no less significant results than the english and the french with kant's critique of pure reason the conception of consciousness advanced so far into the foreground as entirely to absorb psychology kant left behind him an anthropology which was an ingenious and elegant discourse on the principal elements of psychology his scientifically established psychology will ever be sought in the transcendental ascetics and the logic of his critique of reason especially in the chapter on the deduction of categories fichte had no psychology outside of the science of knowledge shelling none outside of his transcendental idealism herbart again had psychology because he replaced the ego as the subject which maintains itself by notions for Stollingen, since he regarded these as psychic quanta which are related to one another with an external independence his psychology became therefore essentially a theory of the mechanism of notions which made the spontaneity of the ego illusory hegel apprehended psychology from a higher principle which distinguished his philosophy from all others from the idea of spirit he distinguished one the subjective two the objective three the absolute mind and thus brought light into a region which had been desolated by the most extreme confusion under the first designation he understood the individual mind which he developed from its naturalness to formal freedom under the second mind as it determines itself in its action by the idea of good under the third mind as in art religion and science it elevates itself to intuition to feeling and to the conception of the absolute the conception of subjective mind again hegel distinguished in three special moments one that of the soul two that of consciousness three that of mind as special sciences he named them respectively anthropology phenomenology and psychology this latter designation i think he would have done better to omit since the name psychology had already come into use for all which he comprised in the doctrine of subjective mind it must remain the general name and hegel might quite properly have called the third part pneumatology a name of which earlier metaphysics had made use under this term hegel understood the entire sphere of the unconscious in man as far as it was still determined by nature immediately as mind it is the passive side of man so far as it appears in its natural qualities changes and in the conflict of the soul with its corporeity in order to make it the symbolic expression of its interior or content one should contemplate the confusion with which before hegel the conception of race temperament talent sex periods of age sleep and waking dreaming custom mimicry etc had been casually treated in order to realize the immeasurable progress he has made here here as in ethics he causes to be conceived a still more strict ordination a still more interior concatenation of determinations than he has presented but the credit of laying the foundation for this connected treatment must remain with him the chief difficulty in human psychology lies in correctly apprehending thought in its unity as well as in its distinction from sensation the animal cannot pass beyond sensation while with man thought constitutes the active principle from the very first and even in his sensations 
apparently he sets out empirically from sensation but essentially he bears himself even in sensation as an intrinsically rational subject the animal as sentient remains in individuality man exalts himself from the individual to the universal we call thought so far as it is opposed to sensation consciousness consciousness however does not arise at first successively but is originally present in man as his thinking relation to himself immediately man does not yet know that he thinks original consciousness is unconsciousness the ego already exists in itself on sich, but not for itself hence consciousness within the sphere of the unconscious can be apprehended only as a self still in its natural state sleeping and waking etc are natural changes contrasted conditions the human state of wakefulness is distinguished from that of animals by the fact that man comes into relation not only to sensuous objectivity but that he also distinguishes himself for himself from his relation it may be contested where the conception of waking should be treated but in this case we must not be confused but must hold fast to the principle it is for this reason that the dream belongs to the sphere of the unconscious although it presupposes the formation of notions and of intuitions while we dream the free distinction of self as subject from objectivity does not occur the condition of dreaming is sleep sleep is however an act of natural vitality for example of a natural process which is independent of thought lunacy is likewise a decadence into unconsciousness the lunatic has a formal consciousness but he is involved in a condition of unconsciousness so far as concerns his crazy notions with respect to these he is not free like the dreamer with respect to the images which hover past in his chaotic soul when the lunatic is freed from his illusion this return to free subjectivity is analogous to awaking from a dream the condition of daydreaming as well as that of somnambulism must be placed in the category of unconsciousness although their mediation may belong to much higher spheres hegel treated the conception of consciousness under the name of phenomenology it constitutes the antithesis of anthropology for in this all determinations are necessary are posited by nature while with consciousness the freedom of thought arises as in itself infinite self-determination as subjectivity which makes as its object its own entire psychic individuality with all its qualities changes and conditions as moments of phenomenology hegel distinguished one consciousness two self-consciousness three rational self-consciousness subject distinguishes itself first from others secondly from itself thirdly from the universal conception which it finds as the identical bond between its outer and inner world reason is the identical essence as well as objectivity in itself as of subjectivity in itself unquestionably this course is a process of knowledge but very different from that which he presented later under the name of theoretical intelligence for consciousness recourse must ever be had to the antithesis of subject and object the object is either given in existence external to me which i seek to know according to its truth or i make myself an object but find objects outside of myself which like me are subjects for themselves or finally i find the conception of reason the necessity of which is the same without as within me 
in his development hegel organically integrated the great achievement of kant and fichte in finding the conception of consciousness for science by so doing however he aroused the greatest opposition philosophy had again given up the doctrine of consciousness and had again fused it with that of theoretical intelligence just as even so strict a hegelian as michelet seeks to be had done but here also we must submit to the consequences of the principle the antithesis of natural psychic individuality is subjectivity as which thinking yet inseparate from will distinguishes itself from itself as ego that which in the third part of his science of subjective mind hegel calls especially mind is a conception which transcends that of the rational self-consciousness by virtue of the fact that the subject as rational becomes content no less than form as individuality it bears a passive relation to be as it were a genius the individual must become self-complacent as subjectivity it is essentially actuosity consciousness itself posits the difference as well as the unity of subject and object but it is still dependent upon that which is presented as its object and does not itself produce the categories of reason though it explores the entire world without and within self knowledge of these is what it produces the subject in itself is truly free only when it produces itself in both form and content freedom holds the antithesis of theoretical and practical in itself the theoretical is the condition of the practical in the same way that individuality is the condition of subjectivity or that this latter is the condition of spirituality in the treatment of theoretical intelligence hegel distinguished one intuition Antoine, two imagination Vorstellen, three thought mind as immediate substance is feeling which as the proper content of mind is progressively formed through it from intuition yet involved in space and time to pure thought the content is the same through all the different steps of intuition imagination and thinking but i change its form and thereby give myself another relation to it i intuit for example the sun as a luminous round body it becomes night and i see it no longer but i have a mental image of it within myself by this image i have freed myself from the externality of the phenomenon the image as a purely ideal object is absolutely fluid i can bring it into relation with a thousand other objects it is also general i can subsume other similar bodies under the notion sun but necessity is wanting when i add this to generality i change imagination to thought the sun is the central body of a planetary system with this apprehension these relations which i can arbitrarily give to the notion of a sun cease and necessary relations take their place nothing is more frequent in the ordinary psychology and logic than the confusion of intuition imagination and thought because they cohere most closely in fact it remains an immortal service of hegel's that he has elucidated their difference upon the foundation which kant's critique of reason afforded the first and exhaustive discussion of his doctrine is found in karl dobbs anthropology but it is as though this labor had never been performed there is also a presentation of the entire doctrine of the subjective mind by hegel himself which is generally entirely ignored when after his death his entire works were published dr Buhlmann undertook to add a commentary from hegel's lectures on the corresponding topics to the short paragraphs of the encyclopedia which he very admirably executed 
here hegel entered very intelligibly into all the difficult points of his systematology he showed in how extended a way he was familiar with the empirical material in the expression of psychic phenomena he evinced himself an ingenious soul painter whom the most delicate shadings of his object did not escape this he did especially in his delineations of the diseases of the soul of somnambulism custom temperament etc among the numerous dissensions of psychologists two points have become generally prominent since hegel's death which we will briefly mention one is the conception of attention the other that of language to attend is according to hegel the act by which the mind distinguishes a content which is present to it as sentient from itself and from other content in itself the condition for this act is therefore that i am subject that i distinguish myself as ego from myself and thereby from all which immediately i am not he presupposes consciousness so long as i exist only as sentient i cease to exist in the specialty of that which i feel but because i am subject i can distinguish myself from myself as a sentient individual i can direct myself in free self-determination to my immediate being this spontaneous direction is attention sensuous certainty and apprehension are moments of this act through it i make my feelings an object for myself i strip off from its content the external time and space conditions wherein i find it i transfer it into the ideal space and the ideal time of consciousness by so doing i make it an intuition which as being in me and remembered by me becomes a mental image the animal is also attentive but only as a sentient individual it remains dependent upon sensuousness there exists a movement of sensation but not a free activity of self-determination the animal cannot form its sensations into intuitions and since intuition again is a condition of representation it can still less reach the latter the animal cannot make its conditions present to itself when a man says he feels that it is warm he has already advanced beyond feeling although it still exists in him as a condition the word intuition is of course derived originally from the sense of sight though it has acquired a general significance for that content which is projected from feeling into consciousness the expression representation is correct in so far as it is intuition which is reproduced by the subject in and from itself representation is free from the connection which intuition bears to feeling it makes the content of intuition independent of a free image from which all that is casual and unessential in the original genesis is omitted representations for example stream wood animal anger command etc are general every representation as such is different from every other but the representing subject distinguishes itself also from its representations and is free from them since they attain existence only through his own activity when a subject ceases to hold the power over its representations it either becomes lunatic or it dreams that which the school of herbart has elaborated as a mechanism of representation into an extended dynamics and statics of representation in the intelligible tract of consciousness is essentially a psychological disguise of the laws of thought we can cast heterogeneous representations promiscuously together as for example in reading books for children in order to exercise them on the particular letter bridge book buck blood ball etc occur promiscuously 
but when we arrange our conceptions we do it according to logical laws language originates according to hegel from the incitement which we feel at the moment in which we wish to express a conception to make a sound as its sign if we had no organs of speech we should of course be able to produce no word in this respect there exists between our mind and organism a teleological connection without thinking we should only express feelings by inarticulate sounds like animals deaf mutes can of themselves alone advance only as far as notions but since they can have no idea of sound they remain dumb and can furnish themselves with a language only by the indirect method of writing as soon as a child endowed with perfect senses begins to form notions it begins to take pleasure in words when we say that language is produced without consciousness we mean to designate merely the unintentionality of the form of the sound and of the grammatical organization this latter is an actual proof that the language forming mind is rational in itself language is the renaissance of notions in phonetic forms which are the peculiar product of mind the reproduction of the notion as such without reference to the sound which custom has fixed to it among a given people we call recollection or reminiscentia recordatio recollection in the form of words is memory language on the one hand is the product of the thought which is latent in its construction on the other hand it is the condition of its development now also it becomes clear how much the self-formation of thought in the construction of conceptions in the passing of judgments and in drawing conclusions is distinguished from those forms which it possesses as consciousness for example as relation of subject and object there exists no psychology except the hegelian which so well develops the interconnection of the forms of the theoretical intelligence the origin of language the consequent process of the transformation of knowledge from step to step the practical relationship of mind proceeds also from feeling as impulse but is mediated especially by difference of theoretical relation it is indeed very pleasant to speak only of will and of representation as schopenhauer's philosophy does without actually deducing its idea so that instinct appetite desire passion and will are thrown promiscuously together but for the critical inspection of science a process so full of confusion cannot succeed such expressions as desires will etc admit a very indeterminate usage but science it should be said exists precisely in order to determine their usage more accurately without thereby destroying their current identity hegel assigned also to eudemonism its systematic position in his psychology and thus freed ethics from all those errors which arise when it is confounded with the idea of good instinct propensity appetite desire passion comes to an end in attaining satisfaction it is agreeable to the subject but the enjoyment of this happiness is quite relative the manifoldness of natural individuality modifies the kind and manner of satisfaction unlimitedly the composition of the means of enjoyment opens in another direction a new infinity of qualitative and quantitative differences which by the opinion of men by popular prejudice and by fashion are modified again without limit that which was at first felt to be pleasure is converted by excess into its opposite or is degraded to something quite indifferent here is never firm ground for ethics schopenhauer has made a great impression upon his contemporaries by choosing the words of goethe's faust 
thus i reel from desire to gratification and in gratification i pine for desire as the text of his gospel of pessimism the thinking man who by his intellect knows the torment to which will of nature condemns all that has life can only have the profoundest pity for that which he attempts to make the principle of ethics but pity is also an entirely relative feeling for it depends partly upon the notion which i form of the wretched condition of myself or of another and partly upon the degree in which this notion is developed here also is nothing but relativity eudemonism demands continuous pleasure there must be no pain here hegel adopted all the rigorism of kant in regarding happiness as an element out of which for ethics a motivation but no principle of action could arise the difference of desires inclinations and passions compels man to reflect as to which of them he shall yield the precedence of satisfaction the eudemonist is constrained to moderation in order to compute for his well-being the correct total well-being must however be subordinated to good the idea of which alone is adequate to stand for the thinking man as the principle of ethics with hegel eudemonism is not represented as a mere illusion as imposture as it is by schopenhauer well-being with its pleasure and displeasure should have no other justification than is permitted it by the idea of good hegel's philosophy may be regarded as the interpretation of another passage of goethe's faust who at the close of his experiences sums them up in the result they alone deserve life and freedom who are daily obliged to conquer it end of george hegel's psychology from hegel as the national philosopher of germany by karl rosenkrantz translated from the german by granville stanley hall published in eighteen seventy four the hymn of creation excerpt by karl gustav jung translated by Bertrice m hinkle from psychology of the unconscious published nineteen sixteen this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the second chapter in miss miller's work is entitled gloria adieu poem onerique when twenty years of age miss miller took a long journey through europe we leave the description to her after a long and rough journey from new york to stockholm from there to petersburg and odessa i found it a true pleasure to leave the world of inhabited cities and to enter the world of waves sky and silence i stayed hours long on deck to dream stretched out in a reclining chair the histories legends and myths of the different countries which i saw in the distance came back to me indistinctly blended together in a sort of luminous mist in which things lost their reality while the dreams and thoughts alone took on somewhat the appearance of reality at first i even avoided all company and kept to myself lost wholly in my dreams where all that i knew of great beautiful and good came back into my consciousness with new strength and new life i also employed a great part of my time writing to my distant friends reading and sketching out short poems about the regions visited some of these poems were of a very serious character it may seem superfluous perhaps to enter intimately into all these details if we recall however the remark made above that when people let their unconscious speak they always tell us the most important things of their intimate selves then even the smallest detail appears to have meaning valuable personalities invariably tell us through their unconscious things that are generally valuable so that patient interest is rewarded 
miss miller describes here a state of introversion after the life of the cities with their many impressions had been absorbing her interest with that already discussed strength of suggestion which powerfully enforced the impression she breathed freely upon the ocean and after so many external impressions became engrossed wholly in the internal with intentional abstraction from the surroundings so that things lost their reality and dreams became truth we know from psychopathology that certain mental disturbances exist which are first manifested by the individuals shutting themselves off slowly more and more from reality and sinking into their fantasies during which process in proportion as the reality loses its hold the inner world gains in reality the determining power this process leads to a certain point which varies with the individual when the patients suddenly become more or less conscious of their separation from reality the event which then enters is the pathological excitation that is to say the patients begin to turn towards the environment with diseased views to be sure which however still represent the compensating although unsuccessful attempt at transference the methods of reaction are naturally very different i will not concern myself more closely with this here this type appears to be generally a psychological rule which holds good for all neurosis and therefore also for the normal in a much less degree we might therefore expect that miss miller after this energetic and persevering introversion which had even encroached for a time upon the feeling of reality would succumb anew to an impression of the real world and also to just as suggestive and energetic an influence as that of her dreams let us proceed with the narrative but as the journey drew to an end the ship's officers outdid themselves in kindness tout se coule a des plumes impresse et du plus amiable and i passed many amusing hours teaching them english on the sicilian coast in the harbour of catania i wrote a sailor's song which was very similar to a song well known on the sea brine wine and damsels fine the italians in general all sing very well and one of the officers who sang on deck during night watch had made a great impression upon me and had given me the idea of writing some words adapted to his melody soon after that i was very nearly obliged to reverse the well-known saying veder napoli e poi mourir that is to say suddenly i became very ill although not dangerously so i recovered to such an extent however that i could go on land to visit the sights of the city in a carriage this day tired me very much and since we had planned to see pisa the following day i went on board early in the evening and soon lay down to sleep without thinking of anything more serious than the beauty of the officers and the ugliness of the italian beggars one is somewhat disappointed at meeting here instead of the expected impression of reality rather a small intermezzo a flirtation nevertheless one of the officers the singer had made a great impression il maviat fait beaucoup de impression the remark at the close of the description sans songer a rien de plume serio la la bouteille des officers and so on diminishes the seriousness of the impression it is true the assumption however that the impression openly influenced the mood very much is supported by the fact that a poem upon a subject of such an erotic character came forth immediately brine wine and damsels fine and in the singer's honor one is only too easily inclined to take such an impression lightly and one admits so gladly the statement of the participators when they represent everything as simple and not at all serious i dwell upon this impression at length because it is important to know that an erotic impression after such an introversion has a deep effect and is undervalued possibly by miss miller 
the suddenly passing sickness is obscure and needs a psychologic interpretation which cannot be touched upon here because of lack of data the phenomena now to be described can only be explained as arising from a disturbance which reached the very depths of her being from naples to livorno the ship travelled for a night during which i slept more or less well my sleep however is seldom deep or dreamless it seemed to me as if my mother's voice awakened me just at the end of the following dream at first i had a vague conception of the words when the morning stars sang together which were the preludium of a certain confused representation of creation and of the mighty quarrels resounding through the universe in spite of the strange contradictory and confused character which is peculiar to the dream there was mingled in it the chorus of an oratorio which had been given by one of the foremost musical societies of new york and with that were also memories of milton's paradise lost then from out of this whirl there slowly emerged certain words which arranged themselves into three strophes, and indeed they seemed to be in my own handwriting on ordinary blue-lined writing paper on a page of my old poetry book which i always carried around with me in short they appeared to me exactly as some minutes later they were in reality in my book miss miller now wrote down the following poem which she arranged somewhat a few months later to make it more nearly in her opinion like the dream original when the eternal first made sound a myriad ears sprang out to hear and throughout all the universe there rolled an echo deep and clear all glory to the god of sound when the eternal first made light a myriad eyes sprang out to look and hearing ears and seeing eyes once more a mighty quarrel took all glory to the god of light when the eternal first gave love a myriad hearts sprang into life ears filled with music eyes with light pealed forth with hearts with love all rife all glory to the god of love before we enter upon miss miller's attempt to bring to light through her suppositions the root of this subliminal creation we will attempt a short analytic survey of the material already in our possession the impression on the ship has already been properly emphasized so that we need have no further difficulty in gaining possession of the dynamic process which brought about this poetical revelation it was made clear in the preceding paragraphs that miss miller possibly had not inconsiderably undervalued the importance of the erotic impression this assumption gains in probability through experience which shows that very generally relatively weak erotic impressions are greatly undervalued one can see this best in cases where those concerned either from social or moral grounds consider an erotic relation as something quite impossible for example parents and children brothers and sisters relations homosexual between older and younger men and so on if the impression is relatively slight then it does not exist at all for the participators if the impression is strong then a tragic dependence arises which may result in some great nonsense or be carried to any extent this lack of understanding can go unbelievably far mothers who see the first erections of the small son in their own bed a sister who half playfully embraces her brother a twenty-year-old daughter who still seats herself on her father's lap and then has strange sensations in her abdomen they are all morally indignant to the highest degree if one speaks of sexuality finally the whole education is carried on with the tacit agreement to know as little as possible of the erotic and to spread abroad the deepest ignorance in regard to it it is no wonder therefore that the judgment in puncto of the importance of an erotic impression is generally unsafe and inadequate miss miller was under the influence of a deep erotic impression as we have seen 
because of the sum total of the feelings aroused by this it does not seem that this impression was more than dimly realized for the dream had to contain a powerful repetition from analytic experience one knows that the early dreams which patients bring for analysis are none the less of especial interest because of the fact that they bring out criticisms and valuations of the physician's personality which previously would have been asked for directly in vain they enrich the conscious impression which the patient had of his physician and often concerning very important points they are naturally erotic observations which the unconscious was forced to make just because of the quite universal undervaluation and uncertain judgment of the relatively weak erotic impression in the drastic and hyperbolic manner of expression of the dream the impression often appears in almost unintelligible form on account of the immeasurable dimension of the symbol a further peculiarity which seems to rest upon the historic strata of the unconscious is this that an erotic impression to which conscious acknowledgment is denied usurps an earlier and discarded transference and expresses itself in that therefore it frequently happens for example that among young girls at the time of their first love remarkable difficulties develop in the capacity for erotic expression which may be reduced analytically to disturbances through a regressive attempt at resuscitation of the father image or the father imago indeed one might presume something similar in miss miller's case for the idea of the masculine creative deity is a derivation analytically and historically psychologic of the father imago and aims above all to replace the discarded infantile father transference in such a way that for the individual the passing from the narrow circle of the family into the wider circle of human society may be simpler or made easier in the light of this reflection we can see in the poem and its preludium the religious poetically formed product of an introversion depending upon the surrogate of the father imago in spite of the incomplete apperception of the effectual impression essential component parts of this are included in the idea of compensation as marks so to speak of its origin feaster has coined for this the striking expression law of the return of the complex the effectual impression was that of the officer singing in the night watch when the morning stars sang together the idea of this opened a new world to the girl creation this creator has created tone then light and then love that the first to be created should have been tone can be made clear only individually for there is no cosmogony except the gnosis of hermes a generally quite unknown system which would have such tendencies but now we might venture a conjecture which is already apparent and which soon will be proven thoroughly namely the following chain of associations the singer the singing morning stars the god of tone the creator the god of light of the sun of the fire and of love the links of this chain are proven by the material with the exception of sun and fire which i put in parenthesis but which however will be proven through what follows in the further course of the analysis all of these expressions with one exception belong to erotic speech my god star light my son fire of love fiery love etc creator appears indistinct at first but becomes understandable through the reference to the undertone of eros to the vibrating chord of nature which attempts to renew itself in every pair of lovers and awaits the wonder of creation miss miller had taken pains to disclose the unconscious creation of her mind to her understanding 
and indeed through a procedure which agrees in principle with psychoanalysis and therefore leads to the same results as psychoanalysis but as usually happens with laymen and beginners miss miller because she had no knowledge of psychoanalysis left off at the thoughts which necessarily bring the deep complex lying at the bottom of it to light in an indirect that is to say censored manner more than this a simple method merely the carrying out of the thought to its conclusion is sufficient to discover the meaning miss miller finds it astonishing that her unconscious fantasy does not following the mosaic account of creation put light in the first place instead of tone end of hymn of creation excerpt by carl gustav jung translated by beatrice m hinkle from the psychology of the unconscious published in 1916The Invitation, Section 1, from the First Part of Preparation for a Christian Life, by Soren Kierkegaard, translated by Lee M. Hollander. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preparation for a Christian Life first part comprising about one-fourth of the whole book come hither unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden and i will give you rest matthew chapter 11 verse 28 the invitation section one come hither it is not at all strange if he who is in danger and needs help speedy immediate help perhaps it is not strange if he cries out come hither nor is it strange that a quack cries his wares come hither i cure all maladies alas for in the case of the quack it is only too true that it is the physician who has need of the sick come hither all ye who at extortionate prices can pay for the cure or at any rate for the medicine here is physic for everybody who can pay come hither in all other cases however it is generally true that he who can help must be sought and when found may be difficult of access and if access is had his help may have to be implored a long time and when his help has been implored a long time he may be moved only with difficulty that is he sets a high price on his services and sometimes precisely when he refuses payment or generously asks for none it is only an expression of how infinitely high he values his services on the other hand he christ who sacrificed himself he sacrifices himself here too it is indeed he who seeks those in need of help is himself the one who goes about and calls almost imploringly come hither he the only one who can help and help with what alone is indispensable and can save from the one truly mortal disease he does not wait for people to come to him but comes himself without having been called for it is he who calls out to them it is he who holds out help and what help indeed that simple sage of antiquity socrates was as infinitely right as the majority who do the opposite are wrong in setting no great price whether on himself or his instruction even if he thus in a certain sense proudly expressed the utter difference in kind between payment and his services 
but he was not so solicitous as to beg any one to come to him notwithstanding or shall i say because he was not altogether sure what his help signified for the more sure one is that his help is the only one obtainable the more reason has he in a human sense to ask a great price for it and the less sure one is the more reason has he to offer freely the possible help he has in order to do at least something for others but he who calls himself the savior and knows that he is he calls out solicitously come hither unto me come hither all ye strange for if he who when it comes to the point perhaps cannot help a single one if such a one should boastfully invite everybody that would not seem so very strange man's nature being such as it is but if a man is absolutely sure of being able to help and at the same time willing to help willing to devote his all in doing so and with all sacrifices then he generally makes at least one reservation which is to make a choice among those he means to help that is however willing one may be still it is not everybody one cares to help one does not care to sacrifice oneself to that extent but he the only one who can really help and really help everybody the only one therefore who really can invite everybody he makes no conditions whatever but utters the invitation which from the beginning of the world seems to have been reserved for him come hither all ye ah human self-sacrifice even when thou art most beautiful and noble when we admire thee most this is a sacrifice still greater which is to sacrifice every provision for one's own self so that in one's willingness to help there is not even the least partiality ah the love that sets no price on oneself that makes one forget altogether that he is the helper and makes one altogether blind as to who it is one helps but infinitely careful only that he be a sufferer whatever else he may be and thus willing unconditionally to help everybody different alas is this from everybody come hither unto me strange for human compassion also and willingly does something for them that labor and are heavy laden one feeds the hungry clothes the naked makes charitable gifts builds charitable institutions and if the compassion be heartfelt perhaps even visits those that labor and are heavy laden but to invite them to come to one that will never do because then all one's household and manner of living would have to be changed for a man cannot himself live in abundance or at any rate in well-being and happiness and at the same time dwell in one and the same house together with and in daily intercourse with the poor and miserable with them that labor and are heavy laden in order to be able to invite them in such wise a man must himself live altogether in the same way as poor as the poorest as lowly as the lowliest familiar with the sorrows and sufferings of life and altogether belonging to the same station as they whom he invites that is they who labor 
and are heavy laden if he wishes to invite a sufferer he must either change his own condition to be like that of the sufferer or else change that of the sufferer to be like his own for if this is not done the difference will stand out only the more by contrast and if you wish to invite all those who suffer for you may make an exception with one of them and change his condition it can be done only in one way which is to change your condition so as to live as they do provided your life be not already lived thus as was the case with him who said come hither unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden thus said he and they who lived with him saw him and behold there was not even the least thing in his manner of life to contradict it with the silent and truthful eloquence of actual performance his life expresses even though he had never in his life said these words his life expresses come hither unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden he abides by his word or he himself is the word he is what he says and also in this sense he is the word john chapter one verse one all ye that labor and are heavy laden strange his only concern is lest there be a single one who labors and is heavy laden who does not hear this invitation neither does he fear that too many will come ah heart room makes house room but where wilt thou find heart room if not in his heart he leaves it to each one how to understand his invitation he has a clear conscience about it for he has invited all those that labor and are heavy laden but what means it then to labor and be heavy laden why does he not offer a clearer explanation so that one may know exactly whom he means and why is he so chary of his words ah thou narrow-minded one he is so chary of his words lest he be narrow-minded and thou narrow-hearted one he is so chary of his words lest he be narrow-hearted for such is his love and love has regard to all as to prevent any one from troubling and searching his heart whether he too be among those invited and he who would insist on a more definite explanation is he not likely to be some self-loving person who is calculating whether this explanation does not particularly fit himself one who does not consider that the more of such exact explanations are offered the more certainly some few would be left in doubt as to whether they were invited ah man why does thine eye see only thyself why is it evil because he is good matthew chapter twenty verse fifteen the invitation to all men opens the arms of him who invites and thus he stands of aspect everlasting but no sooner is a closer explanation attempted which might help one or the other to another kind of certainty than his aspect would be transformed and as it were a shadow of change would pass over his countenance i will give you rest strange for then the words come hither unto me must be understood to mean stay with me i am rest or it is rest to remain with me 
It is not then, as in other cases, where he who helps and says, Come hither, must afterwards say, Now depart again, explaining to each one where the help he needs is to be found, where the healing herb grows which will cure him, or where the quiet spot is found where he may rest from labor, or where the happier continent exists where one is not heavy laden. But, no, he who opens his arms, inviting every one, ah, if all, all they that labor and are heavy laden came to him, he would fold them all to his heart, saying, Stay with me now, for to stay with me is rest. The helper himself is the help. Ah, strange, he who invites everybody and wishes to help everybody, his manner of treating the sick is as if calculated for every sick man, and as if every sick man who comes to him were his only patient. For otherwise, a physician divides his time among many patients, who, however great their number, still are far, far from being all mankind. He will prescribe the medicine, he will say what is to be done, and how it is to be used, and then he will go to some other patient. Or, in case the patient should visit him, he will let him depart. The physician cannot remain sitting all day with one patient, and still less can he have all his patients about him in his home, and yet sit all day with one patient without neglecting the others. For this reason the helper and his help are not one and the same thing. The help which the physician prescribes is kept with him by the patient all day, so that he may constantly use it while the physician visits him now and again, or he visits the physician now and again. But if the helper is also the help, why then he will stay with the sick man all day, or the sick man with him. Ah, strange that it is just this helper who invites all men. End of the Invitation, Section 1 From the first part of Preparation for a Christian Life by Soren Kierkegaard Translated by Lee M. Hollander Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson January Days, Chapter 48 from In New England Fields and Woods by Roland E. Robinson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 48 January Days. In these midwinter days, how muffled is the earth! in its immaculate raiment, so disguised in whiteness that familiar places are strange, rough hollows smooth to mere undulations, deceitful to the eye and feet, and level fields so piled with heaps and ridges that their owners scarcely recognize them. The hovel is as regally roofed as the palace. The rudest fence is a hedge of pearl, finer than a wall of marble, and the meanest wayside weed is a white flower of fairyland. The woods, which frost and November winds stripped of their leafy thatch, are roofed again, now with an arabesque of alabaster more delicate than the green canopy that summer unfolded, and all the floor is set in noiseless pavement, traced with a shifting pattern of blue shadows. In these silent aisles the echoes are smothered at their birth. There is no response of airy voices to the faint call of the winter birds. The sound of the axe stroke flies no farther than the pungent fragrance of the smoke that drifts in a blue haze from the chopper's fire. The report of the gun awakes no answering report, 
and each mellow note of the hound comes separate to the ear with no jangle of reverberations fox and hound wallow through the snow a crumbling furrow that obliterates identity of either trail yet there are tracks that tell as plain as written words who made them here have fallen lightly as snowflakes the broad pads of the hare white as the snow he trod there the parallel tracks of another winter masker the weasel and those of the squirrel linking tree to tree the leaps of a tiny wood mouse are lightly marked upon the feathery surface to where there is the imprint of a light swift pinion on either side and the little story of his wandering ends one crimson blood drop the period that marks the finny in the blue shadow at the bottom of that winding furrow are the dainty footprints of a grouse and you wonder why he so strong of wing should choose to wade laboriously the clogging snow even in his briefest trip rather than make his way through the unresisting air and the snow-written record of his wayward wanderings tells not why suddenly as if a mine had been sprung where your next footstep should fall and with almost as startling though harmless effect another of his wild tribe burst upward through the unmarked white floor and goes whirling and clattering away scattering in powdery ruin the maze of delicate tracery the snowfall rot and vanishes leaving only an aerial pathway of naked twigs to mark his impetuous passage in the twilight of an evergreen thicket sits a great horned owl like a hermit in his cell in pious contemplation of his own holiness and the world's wickedness but this recluse hates not sin only daylight in mankind out in the fields you may find the white-robed brother of this gray friar a pilgrim from the far north brooding in the very face of the sun on some stack or outlying barn but he will not suffer you to come so near to him as will the solemn anchorite who stares at you unmoved as a graven image till you come within the very shadows of his roof marsh and channel are scarcely distinguishable now but by the white domes of the muskrat's winter homes and here and there a sprawling thicket or button bush for the rank growth of weeds is beaten flat and the deep snow covers it and the channel ice in one unbroken sheet champlain's sheltered bays and coves are frozen and white with snow or frost and the open water whether still or storm-tossed black beneath clouds or bluer than the blue dome that arches it looks as cold as ice and snow sometimes its steaming breath lies close above it sometimes mounts in swaying lofty columns to the sky but always cold and ghostly without expression of warmth or life so far away to hoary peaks that shine with a glittering gleam against the blue rim of the sky or to the furthest blue-gray line of woodland that borders the horizon stretches the universal whiteness so coldly shines the sun from the low curve of his course and so chilly comes the lightest waft of wind from wheresoever it listeth that it tasks the imagination to picture any land on all the earth where spring is just awakening fresh life or where summer dwells amid green leaves and bright flowers the music of birds and running waters and of warm waves on pleasant shores or autumn yet lingers in the gorgeousness of many hues how far off beyond this world seems the possibility of such seasons how enduring and relentless this which encompasses us and then at the close of the brief white day the sunset paints a promise and a prophecy in a blaze of color on the sky the gray clouds kindle with red and yellow fire that burns about their purple hearts in tints of infinite variety while behind them and the dark blue rampart of the mountains flames the last glory of the departing sun fading in a tint of tender green to the upper blue even the cold snow at our feet flushes with warm color and the eastern hills blush roseate against the climbing darkening shadow of the earth it is as if some land of summer whose brightness has never been told lay unveiled before us its delectable mountains splendid with innumerable hues 
its lakes and streams of gold rippling to purple shores seeming not so far before us but that we might by a little journey come to them end of january days chapter forty eight from in new england fields and woods by roland e robinson read for librivox dot org by nemo Cranborg's Marionettes by Lola Ridge from the January eleventh, nineteen nineteen edition of the Dial. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Ferrar. Whitman and not Poe was the true pioneer of American poetry poe filled narrow unpliant forms with a wild fantastic supple life he played freely within circumscribed boundaries because boundaries did not constrict him he was the kind of bird that sings most sweetly in a cage but whitman's was a grandly nihilistic gesture he assailed the whole bastille of form and brought it tumbling about his own ears he was a liberator of rhythms as Nietzsche was of ethics, and at that he achieved no modern miracle. His was the world-old revolt of life, weary of constraining her mighty rhythms in piano tunes. Wholly a democrat, he was concerned only with the broad and common currents of existence, whatever surrounded and included the life of crowds, and like most democrats he was unaware of nuances but in a literary sense his service to america equaled that of washington and the co-fathers of the revolution like theirs his declaration of independence sounded a barbaric yawp over the roofs of the world and though we may smile tolerantly at the clumsy ways of a pioneer and clear away his good rank grasses it is over his unrailed clearing rather than along the slender trail of poe that the truly american poets will pass to their own he has made it easier for men so unlike as frost and sandberg and boldenheim and masters to grow and push out horizons even vachel lindsay would not have had space enough for his adorable ragtime if whitman's breath had not blown over the stucco palaces and rose gardens and high english hedges and left a great clear space like a prairie for free rhythms to gallop in but of all the poets that are now travailing out of this large incoherence that is america cramborg is most strangely and poignantly alone whether like some elfin hamlet folded in an ironic smile as in a cloak or gazing out of his own mushrooms solemn-eyed gnome-like with naively interested eyes on an unrelated world he seems to have no artistic roots this is apparent even in mushrooms for never since the great walt scattered his leaves over an offended continent has there been a poetic firstling that has shown so few influences its method then tentative uncertain seemed a seed blown from nowhere now we feel its upward growth in these plays for poem mimes in which common words made taut like strings seem to have acquired a new and silvery timbre cramborg seems to melt life as in a crucible and pour it into these quaintly human marionettes from whom it perpetually burns over except for manikin and minikin who probably flouted their begetter's plan by announcing themselves as full-blown egos one can imagine these little dramas being staged in souls and played by the people who live in people so eerily intimate are they all six plays have a musical structure deftly surely with his sensitive musician's fingers Krimborg touches those tenuous quivering threads that radiate beneath the compact surface of life first he makes a silence 
a silence of wheels and cranes and a silence of subways and barrel organs even a silence of feet stamping upon gallery floors and you who would watch his swaying motifs in their rhythmic dances and listen to their subtle music must pass through this luminous silence that surrounds them like an aura but if you would enjoy the full lustre of each silvery dissonance you must hush those two clamorous memories of broadway and the blind white scream of spotlights for Kramborg sweeps away all ready-made gestures and all unnecessary noises he deals direct with life and life needs silence to be heard when the curtain rises on mannequin and minikin a bisque play we see only a mantel shelf and a huge clock ticking away eternity between two aristocratic bisque figures a boy in cerise and a girl in cornflower blue the servant girl whom we never see but of whose nearness we are always aware has turned them away from each other so that they see only the everlasting armchair the everlasting tiger skin the everlasting yellow green and purple books and into these two inanimates who recall their childhood in the english museum Krimborg has poured a full sweet tide of life we do not think of them as puppets but as living essences gestures of surrounded beauty captured like two bright birds and held static in time minikin asking who made me what i am who dreamed me in motionless clay or voicing her jealousy of the servant minikin who does not know how old she is is as perfect of her kind as any of the great characters of literature Manikin says in his sad, wise philosophy, the life of an animate is a procession of deaths with but a secret sorrowing candle guttering lower and lower on the path to the grave. The life of an inanimate is as serenely enduring as all still things are. And I feel this little play to be of such stuff as will prove to be serenely enduring unlike some of cranbrook's other work it has no loose repetitions straying like uncared-for children and no frayed ends the whole is correlated into a perfect form a lesser artist might have made a catastrophic finale by letting the servant girl shatter the great happy centuries ahead by sweeping minikin from the everlasting shelf as it is the play leaves off on the progressive chord only the mellow chimes of the clock striking the hour round the silence like the last touch on a jewel of the comedies lima beans a scherzo play with a dainty allegro movement is a prolonged ripple of quaintly satirical laughter in which Krimborg, delicately whimsically as some supernaturally wise gnome mocks at life with her own symbols jack's house a cubic play is not so easily disposed of it has a way of leaving one's conception of it swinging foolishly like an empty cage at first one follows pleasantly the miming of its two figures and smiles at jack's expectations of his doll wife who is hardly more than a delicious pout and what has a pout to do with home-making later this little oblique satire on the american home acts as an emotional irritant there is something vaguely chilling about an atmosphere where two black pillows on our green couch are the make-believe children besides the poet's thought has a trick of whisking into ambush and out again tagging and dancing away making impish mouths one leaves it with a sense of futility and of being wounded uselessly and of feeling bits of severed life fumbling for each other and yet for those of us who have seen jack's house produced by the other players and listened to the wistfully importunate accompaniment of julian friedman's music this parody of a home will rock in our memory no matter what we grow to in blue and green a shadow play love avid morbidly aware eternally touching and swaying apart is again the dominant motif 
the two figures talking in silvery monotones while fragments of their lives dance a shadow dance against a blue california sky compare their dissonances with an exquisite and intimate clarity blowing through each other's consciousness like two streams of faintly iridescent water if a man and woman could so commune through their mortal opacity then these two might be any man and any woman who had tried to mould the other to his own image only to find the image mean commonplace bitterly familiar a sight to be effaced with the first recognition this thought of our multiple spiritual recreations of each other finds constant expression in cranbord's work the old figure in when the willow nods says of the girl your least sly look recreates folk to your image and it is the main theme of people who die in this lonely dream play love has almost ceased to importune her dead children and the two figures are as shells that we hold to our ear and through which we hear the roaring backwash of life it seems in a sense to be a sequel to blue and green penetrating even deeper than the latter into inner sacristics as dramatic structures these two plays are the weakest in the group perhaps they are spiritual records done at a too close perspective to be expressed in conscious terms of art but in order to assume any dramatic or even any permanent literary value they would have to be recast and all those groping segments constrained into some definite form as it is they are as good wine that has been spilled on the ground instead of poured into clear-cut goblets the book is at once a challenge and a stimulus it reminds us that the artist's interpretation of life must be more than a record of action or a corroboration of registered emotions kipling achieved these brilliantly and reached his period before thirty our individual reactions to the tangible beat in ever dwindling vibrations the exploration of the intangible is the one inexhaustible adventure blows gifts kisses wine stars winds sun the time comes to every artist when he has answered even these and when the raised and visible signs by which our mute souls quibble to each other need to be re-energized by the impetus of some new discovery and it is this spirit of discovery this getting out and making a clearing instead of huddling in mental tenements that is cranbourg's great significance in one almost painfully clutching gesture that of musically monotonous repetitions he resembles maeterlinck but he has none of the great belgian's fear of personal extinction his spiritual attitude is serenely robust and his regret is never for people who die but for the people who die in people those fragile and lovely images the ego fashions of its beloved whether we like him or not it will soon be obligatory to recognize cranbourg as an impelling force in the new american drama in discarding old forms he has merely thrown away what to him are worn-out swaddlings no longer holy enough or spacious enough to contain the living growing essence his aim is to make life face itself anew by the aid of new symbols life never to be persuaded or reconciled by its own bitterly familiar image End of Cranbourg's Marionettes by Lola Ridge Letter to Tramps To Tramps, The Unemployed, The Disinherited, and Miserable by Lucy E. Parsons This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A word to the 35,000 now tramping the streets of this great city. With hands in pockets, gazing listlessly about you with the evidences of wealth and pleasure of which you own no part. Not sufficient even to purchase yourself a bit of food with which to appease the pangs of hunger now gnawing at your vitals. 
It is with you and the hundreds of thousands of others similarly situated in this great land of plenty that I wish to have a word. Have you not worked hard all your life, since you were old enough for your labor to be of use in the production of wealth? Have you not toiled long, hard, and laboriously in producing wealth? And in all those years of drudgery, do you not know you have produced thousands upon thousands of dollars worth of wealth, which you did not then, do not now, and unless you act, never will own any part in? Do you not know that when you were harnessed to a machine, and that machine harnessed to steam, and thus you toiled your ten, twelve, and sixteen hours in the twenty-four, that during this time and all these years you received only enough of your labor product to furnish yourself the bare, coarse necessities of life, and that when you wished to purchase anything for yourself and family, it always had to be of the cheapest quality. If you wanted to go anywhere, you had to wait until Sunday. So little did you receive your unremitting toil that you dare not stop for a moment, as it were. And do you not know that with all your squeezing, pinching, and economizing, that you never were enabled to keep but a few days ahead of the wolves of want? And that at last, when the caprice of your employer saw fit to create an artificial famine by limiting production, that the fires in the furnace were extinguished, the iron horse to which you had been harnessed was stilled, the factory door locked up, you turned upon the highway, a tramp with hunger in your stomach, and rags upon your back. Yet your employer told you that it was overproduction which made him close up. Who cared for the bitter tears and heart pangs of your loving wife and helpless children when you bid them a loving God bless you and turned upon the tramper's road to seek employment elsewhere? I say who cared for those heartaches and pains? You were only a tramp now. To be execrated and denounced as a worthless tramp and a vagrant by that very class who had been engaged all those years in robbing you and yours. Then can you not see that the good boss or the bad boss cuts no figure whatever, that you are the common prey of both, and that their mission is simply robbery? Can you not see that it is the industrial system and not the boss which must be changed? Now when all these bright summer and autumn days are going by, and you have no employment, and consequently can save up nothing. And when the winter's blast sweeps down from the north, and all the earth is wrapped in a shroud of ice, hearken not to the voice of the hypocrite who will tell you that it was ordained by God that the poor ye have always, or to the arrogant robber who will say to you that you drank up all your wages last summer when you had work, and that is the reason why you have nothing now, and the workhouse or the woodyard is too good for you that you ought to be shot. And shoot you they will if you present your petition in too emphatic a manner. So hearken not to them, but list. Next winter, when the cold blasts are keeping through the rents in your seedy garments, when the frost is biting your feet through the holes in your worn-out shoes, and when all wretchedness seems to have centered in and upon you, when misery has marked you for her own, and life has become a burden and existence a mockery, when you have walked the streets by day and slept upon hard boards by night, and at last determined by your own hand to take your life, for you would rather go out into utter nothingness than to longer endure an existence which has become such a burden. So perchance you determine to dash yourself into the cold embrace of the lake rather than longer suffer thus but halt before you commit this last tragic act in the drama of your simple existence. Stop. Is there nothing you can do to ensure those whom you are about to orphan against a like fate? The waves will only dash over you in mockery of your rash act, but stroll you down the avenues of the rich and look upon the magnificent plate windows into their voluptuous homes, and here you will discover the very identical robbers who have despoiled you and yours. Then let your tragedy be enacted here. Awaken them from their wanton sports at your expense. Send forth your petition and let them read it by the red glare of destruction. Thus, when you cast one long, lingering look behind, you can be assured that you have spoken to these robbers in the only language which they have ever been able to understand. 
for they have never yet deigned to notice any petition from their slaves that they were not compelled to read by the red glare bursting from the cannon's mouths, or that was not handed to them upon the point of the sword. You need no organization when you make up your mind to present this kind of petition. In fact, an organization would be a detriment to you. But each of you hungry tramps who read these lines avail yourselves of those little methods of warfare which science has placed in the hands of the poor man, and you will become a power in this or any other land. Learn the use of explosives. End of Letter to Tramps To Tramps, the Unemployed, the Disinherited, and Miserable by Lucy E. Parsons Native Americans by Bob Brown This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org American Cheddars The first American Cheddar was made soon after 1620 around Plymouth by pilgrim fathers who brought along not only cheese from the homeland but a live cow to continue the supply proof of our ability to manufacture cheddar of our own lies in the fact that by seventeen ninety we were exporting it back to england it was called cheddar after the english original named for the village of cheddar near bristol more than a century ago it made a new name for itself herkimer county cheese from the section of new york state where it was first made best herkimer still equals its several distinguished competitors coon colorado blackie california jack pineapple sage vermont colby and wisconsin longhorn the english call our imitation yankee or american cheddar while here at home it was popularly known as yellow or store cheese from its prominent position in every country store also apple pie cheese because of its affinity for the all-american dessert the first cheddar factory was founded by jesse williams in rome new york just over a century ago and with herkimer county cheddar already widely known this established new york as the preferred store-bought in cheese an account of new york's cheese business in the pioneer wooden nutmeg era is found in ernest elmo calkin's interesting book they broke the prairies. A Yankee named Sylvanus Ferris, the most successful dairyman of Herkimer County in the first decades of the 1800s, teamed up with Robert Nesbitt, the old Quaker cheese buyer. They bought from farmers in the region and sold in New York City. And, according to the business ethics of the times, Nesbitt went ahead to cheapen the cheese offered by deprecating its quality, hinting at a bad market and departing without buying later when ferris arrived in a more optimistic mood offering a slightly better price the seller unaware they were partners and ignorant of the market price snapped up the offer similar sharp trade tactics put too much green cheese on the market so those honestly aged from a minimum of eight months up to two years fetched higher prices they were called old such as old herkimer old wisconsin longhorn and old california jack although the established cheddar ages are three fresh medium cured and cured or aged commercially they are divided into two and described as mild and sharp the most popular are named for their states colorado illinois kentucky new york ohio vermont and wisconsin two new york staters are called and named separately coon and herkimer county tillamook goes by its own name with no mention of oregon pineapple monterey jack and sage are seldom listed as cheddars at all although they are basically that brick brick is the one and only cheese for which the whole world gives america credit runners-up are liederkranz which rivals say is too close to limburger and pineapple which is only a cheddar under its criss-crossed painted and flavored rind yet brick is no more distinguished than either of the hundred percent americans and in our opinion is less worth bragging about it is a medium firm 
mild to strong slicing cheese for sandwiches and melting in hot dishes its texture is elastic but not rubbery its taste sweetish and it is full of little round holes or eyes all this has inspired enthusiasts to liken it to emmentaler the most appropriate name for it has long been married man's limburger to make up for the mildness caraway seed is sometimes added about civil war time john jossie a dairyman of dodge county wisconsin came up with this novelty a rennet cheese made of whole cow's milk the curd is cut like cheddar heated stirred and cooked firm to put in a brick-shaped box without a bottom and with slits in the sides to drain when this is set on the draining table a couple of bricks are also laid on the cooked curd for pressure it is this double use of bricks for shaping and for pressing that has led to the confusion about which came first in originating the name the formed bricks of cheese are rubbed with salt for three days and they ripen slowly taking up to two months we eat several million pounds a year and ninety five per cent of that comes from wisconsin with a trickle from new york colorado blacky cheese a subtly different american cheddar is putting colorado on our cheese map it is called blackie from the black waxed rind and it resembles vermont state cheese although it is flatter this is a proud new american product proving that although papa cheddar was born in england his american kinfolk have developed independent and valuable characters all on their own coon cheese coon cheese is full of flavor from being aged on shelves at a higher temperature than cold storage its rind is darker from the growth of mold and this shade is sometimes painted on more ordinary cheddars to make them look like coon which always brings a ten percent premium above the general run made at lowville new york it has received high praise from a host of admirers among them the french cook clementine in phineas beck's kitchen who raised it to the par of french immortals by calling it fromage de coon clementine used it with scintillating success in countless french recipes which ended with the words gratiné au four et servir très chaud she made baguettes of it by soaking sticks three-eighths inch square and one and a half inches long in lukewarm milk rolling them in flour beaten egg and bread crumbs and browning them instantaneously in boiling oil herkimer county cheese the standard method for making american cheddar was established in herkimer county new york in eighteen forty one and has been rigidly maintained down to this day made with rennet and a bacterial starter the curd is cut and pressed to squeeze out all of the whey and then aged in cylindrical forms for a year or more herkimer leads the whole breed by being flaky brittle sharp and nutty with a crumb that will crumble and a soft mouth-watering pale orange color when it is properly aged isigny isigny is a native american cheese that came a cropper it seems to be extinct now and perhaps that is all to the good for it never meant to be anything more than another camembert of which we have plenty of imitation not long after the civil war the attempt was made to perfect isigny the curd was carefully prepared according to an original formula washed and rubbed and set aside to come of age but when it did alas it was more like limburger than camembert and since good domestic limburger was then a dime a pound obviously it wouldn't pay off yet in shape of the newborn resembled camembert although it was much larger so they cut it down and named it after the delicate french creme de signy jack california jack and monterey jack jack was first known as monterey cheese from the california county where it originated then it was called jack for short and only now takes its full name after sixty years of popularity on the west coast because it is little known in the east and has to be shipped so far it commands the top cheddar price monterey jack is a stirred curd cheddar without any annatto coloring it is sweeter than most and milder when young but it gets sharper with age and more expensive because of storage costs leader crans 
no native american cheese has been so widely ballyhooed and so deservedly as liederkranz which translates wreath of song back in the gay inventive nineties emile frey a young delicatessen keeper in new york tried to please some bereft customers by making an imitation of bismarck schloss casa this was imperative because the imported german cheese didn't stand up during the long sea trip and emile's customers mostly members of the famous liederkranz singing society didn't feel like singing without it but emile's attempts at imitation only added indigestion to their dejection until one day fabelhaft one of those cheese dream castles in spain came true he turned out a tawny altogether golden tangy and mellow little marvel that actually was an improvement on bismarck's old schloss casa better than brick it was a deodorized limburger both a man's cheese and one that cheese conscious women adored emil named it wreath of song for the leader Kranz customers it soon became as internationally known as tabasco from texas or parisian camembert which it slightly resembles borden's bought out fry in nineteen twenty nine and they enjoy telling the story of a G.I. who, to celebrate V.E. Day in Paris, sent to his family in Indiana, only a few miles from the factory at Van Wert, Ohio, a whole case of what he had learned was the finest cheese France could make, and when the family opened it, there was Liederkranz. Another deserved distinction is that of being sandwiched in between two foreign immortals in the following recipe schnitzel bank pot one ripe camembert cheese one liederkranz one eighth pound imported roquefort one quarter pound butter one tablespoon flour one cup cream one half cup finely chopped olives one quarter cup canned pimento a sprinkling of cayenne depending on whether or not you like the edible rind of camembert and liederkranz you can leave it on scrape any thick part off or remove it all mash the soft creams together with the roquefort butter and flour using a silver fork put the mix into an enameled pan for anything with a metal surface will turn the cheese black in cooking stir in the cream and keep stirring until you have a smooth creamy sauce strain through sieve or cheesecloth and mix in the olives and pimento thoroughly sprinkle well with cayenne and put into a pot to mellow for a few days or much longer the name schnitzelbank comes from school bench a game this snappy sweet pot is specially suited to a beer party and stein songs it is also the affinity spread with rye and pumpernickel and may be served in small sandwiches or on crackers celery and such to make appetizing tidbits for cocktails tea or cider like the trinity of cheeses that make it the mixture is eaten best at room temperature when its flavor is fullest if kept in the refrigerator it should be taken out a couple of hours before serving since it is a natural cheese mixture which has gone through no process or doping with preservative it will not keep more than two weeks this mellow sharp mix is the sort of ideal the factory processors shoot at with their olive pimento abominations once you've potted your own you'll find it gives the same thrill as garnishing your own lip tower minnesota blue the discovery of sandstone caves in the bluffs along the mississippi in and near the twin cities of minnesota has established a distinctive type of blue cheese named for the state although the roquefort process of france is followed and the cheese is inoculated in the same way by mold from bread it can never equal the genuine imported marked with its red sheep brand because the milk used in minnesota blue is cow's milk and the caves are sandstone instead of limestone yet this is an excellent blue cheese in its own right pineapple pineapple cheese is named after its shape rather than its flavor although there are rumors that some pineapple flavor is noticeable near the oiled rind this flavor does not penetrate through to the cheddar center many makers of processed cheese have tampered with the original so today you can't be sure of anything except getting a smaller size every year or two at a higher price 
originally six pounds the pineapple has shrunk to nearly six ounces the proper bright orange oiled and shellacked surface is more apt to be a sickly lemon always an ornamental cheese it once stood in state on the sideboard under a silver bell also made to represent a pineapple you cut a top slice off the cheese just as you would off the fruit and there was a rose-colored fine-tasting mellow hard cheese to spoon out with a special silver cheese spoon or scoop between meals the silver top was put on the silver holder and the oiled and shellacked rind kept the cheese moist even when the pineapple was eaten down to the rind the shell served as a dunking bowl to fill with some salubrious cold fondue or salad made in the same manner as cheddar with the curd cooked harder pineapple's distinction lies in being hung in a net that makes diamond-shaped corrugations on the surface simulating the sections of the fruit it is a pioneer american product with almost a century and a half of service since lewis m norton conceived it in eighteen hundred eight in litchfield county connecticut there in eighteen forty five he built a factory and made a deserved fortune out of his decorative ingenuity with what before had been plain unromantic yellow or store cheese perhaps his inspiration came from cone-shaped cheshire in old england also called pineapple cheese combined with the hanging up of provolones in italy that leaves the looser pattern of the four sustaining strings sage vermont sage and vermont state the story of sage cheese or green cheese as it was called originally shows the several phases most cheeses have gone through from their simple honest beginnings to commercialization and sometimes back to the real thing the english encyclopedia of practical cookery has an early sage recipe this is a species of cream cheese made by adding sage leaves and greening to the milk a very good receipt for it is given thus bruise the tops of fresh young red sage leaves with an equal quantity of spinach leaves and squeeze out the juice add this to the extract of rennet and stir into the milk as much as your taste may deem sufficient break the curd when it comes salt it fill the vat high with it press for a few hours and then turn the cheese every day fancy cheese in america lay charles a Publo records the commercialization of the cheese mentioned above a century or two later in nineteen ten sage cheese is another modified form of the cheddar variety its distinguishing features are a mottled green color and a sage flavor the usual method of manufacture is as follows one-third of the total amount of milk is placed in a vat by itself and colored green by the addition of eight to twelve ounces of commercial sage color to each one thousand pounds of milk if green corn leaves unavailable in england or other substances are used for coloring the amounts will vary accordingly the milk is then made up by the regular cheddar method as is also the remaining two-thirds in a separate vat at the time of removing the whey the green and white curds are mixed some prefer however to mix the curds at the time of milling as a more distinct color is secured after milling the sage extract flavoring is sprayed over the curd with an atomizer the curd is then salted and pressed into the regular cheddar shapes and sizes a very satisfactory sage cheese is made at the new york state college of agriculture by simply dropping green coloring made from the leaves of corn and spinach upon the curd after milling an even green modeling is thus easily secured without additional labor sage flavoring extract is sprayed over the curd by an atomizer one half ounce of flavoring is usually sufficient for a hundred pounds of curd and can be secured from dairy supply houses a modern cheese authority reported on the current nineteen fifty three method instead of sage leaves or tea prepared from them at present the cheese is flavored with oil of dalmatian wild sage because it has the sharpest flavor this piney oil thujone is diluted with water two hundred fifty parts to one and either added to the milk 
or sprayed over the curds one eighth ounce for five hundred quarts of milk in scouting around for a possible maker of the real thing today we wrote to vrest orton of vermont and got this reply sage cheese is one of the really indigenous and best native vermont products so far as i know there is only one factory making it and that is my friend george crowley's he makes a limited amount for my vermont country store it is the fine old-time full cream cheese flavored with real sage on this hangs a tale some years ago i couldn't get enough sage cheese we never can so i asked a wisconsin cheesemaker if he would make some said he would but couldn't at that time because the alfalfa wasn't ripe i said what in hell has alfalfa got to do with sage cheese he said well we flavor the sage cheese with a synthetic sage flavor and then throw in some pieces of chopped up alfalfa to make it look green so i said to hell with that and the next time i saw george crowley i told him the story and george said we don't use synthetic flavor alfalfa or anything like that then what do you use george i inquired we use real sage why well because it's cheaper than that synthetic stuff the genuine vermont sage arrived here are our notes on it oh wilderness were paradise enow my taste buds come to full flower with the sage there's a slight burned savor recalling smoked cheese although not related in any way mildly resinous like that near east one packed in pine suggesting the well sage dressing of a turkey a round mouthful of luscious mellowness with a bouquet a snapping reminder to the nose and there's just a soupçon of new-mown hay above the green freckles of herb to delight the eye and set the fancy free so this is the very table verte green cheese the moon is made of it vert veritable a general favor with everybody who ever tasted it for generations of lusty crumblers old-fashioned vermont state store cheese we received from savant vrest orton another letter together with some vermont store cheese and some crackers this cheese is our regular old-fashioned store cheese it's been in old country stores for generations and we have been pioneers in spreading the word about it it is of course a natural aged cheese no processing no fussing no fooling with it it's made the same way it was back in eighteen seventy by the old-time colby method which makes a cheese which is not so dry as cheddar and also has holes in it something like swiss also it ages faster did you know that during the last part of the nineteenth century and part of the twentieth vermont was the leading cheese-making state in the union when i was a lad every town in vermont had one or more cheese factories now there are only two left not counting any that make process process isn't cheese the crackers are the old-time store cracker every vermonter used to buy a big barrel once a year to set in the buttery and eat the classic dish is crackers broken up in a bowl of cold milk with a hunk of cheddar cheese like this on the side grand snack grand midnight supper grand anything these crackers are not sweet not salt and as such make a good base for anything swell with clam chowder also with toasted cheese tillamook it takes two pocket-sized but thick yellow volumes to record the story of oregon's great tillamook the cheddar box by dean collins comes neatly bound and boxed in golden cloth stamped with a purple title like the rind of a real tillamook volume one is entitled cheese cheddar and volume two is a two pound cheddar cheese labeled tillamook and molded to fit inside its book jacket we borrowed volume one from a noted litterateur and never could get him to come across with volume two we guessed its fate however from a note on the flyleaf of the only tome available this is an excellent cheese full cream and medium sharp and a unique set of books in which volume two suggests bacon's some books are to be tasted others to be swallowed and some few to be chewed and digested wisconsin longhorn since we began this chapter with all american cheddars it is only fitting to end with wisconsin longhorn a sort of national standard even though it's not nearly so fancy 
or high priced as some of the regional natives that can approach its enormous output it's one of those all-purpose round cheeses that even taste round in your mouth we are specially partial to it most cheddars are named after their states yet putting all of these thirty-seven states together they produce only about half as much as wisconsin alone besides longhorn in wisconsin there are a dozen regional competitors ranging from white twin cheddar to which no annatto coloring has been added through green bay cheese to wisconsin redskin and martha washington aged proudly set forth by p h casper of bear creek who is said to have won more prizes in forty years than any ten cheesemakers put together to help guarantee a market for all this excellent apple pie cheese the wisconsin state legislature made a law about it recognizing the truth of eugene field's jingle apple pie without cheese is like a kiss without a squeeze small matter in the badger state when the affinity is made legal and the couple lawfully wedded in statute number one hundred sixty thousand zero sixty five it's still in force butter and cheese to be served every person firm or corporation duly licensed to operate a hotel or restaurant shall serve with each meal for which a charge of twenty five cents or more is made at least two-thirds of an ounce of wisconsin butter and two-thirds of an ounce of wisconsin cheese besides longhorn wisconsin leads in limburger it produces so much swiss that the state is sometimes called swissconsin end of native americans by bob brown read by betty b Pablo Picasso by Marius de Zayas from the April-July issue of Camera Work, 1911. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pablo Picasso. Let me say at the beginning that I do not believe in art criticism and the more especially when it is concerned with painting. I grant that everyone has the right to express their opinion in art matters, to applaud or disapprove according to their own personal way of seeing and feeling. But I hold that they should do so without assuming any authority and without pretending to possess the absolute truth or even a relative one and also that they should not base their judgments on established rules upon the pretense that they are consecrated by use and by the criterion of high authority between a civil or a penal judge and a critic there is a great difference the judge judges according to the law but does not make the law he has to submit himself to the letter and the spirit of the law though it might conflict with his personal opinions, because that law is an absolute rule of conduct, dictated by society, to which all have to submit. But art is free. It has never had, it has not, and will never have a legislature, in spite of the academies. And every artist has the right to interpret nature as he pleases, or as he can, leaving to the public the liberty to applaud or condemn theoretically. Every critic is a priest of a dogma, of a system, and condemns implacably what he finds to be out of his faith, a faith not reasoned but imposed. He never stops to consider the personality of the artist whose work he is judging to investigate what his tendencies are, what his purpose is, or what efforts he made to attain his object, and to what point he has realized his program. I have devoted my life to the study of art, principally painting and sculpture. I believe I have seen all that is worth seeing, and I have never dared pass sentence on a work declaring it good even if signed by the most renowned artist, 
nor declare it bad, though it bears the name of a person totally unknown. At the most, I dare say that it pleases or displeases me, and to express the personal motives of my impressions. Scholastic criticism has never profited anyone. On the contrary, it has always restrained the spirit of a creator. It has always discouraged, humiliated, and killed those who have had the weakness to take it into consideration. Each epoch has had its artists and must have its art, as each also has its men of science and its science. And anyone who intends to oppose a dike to the flood tide of human genius is perverse or a fool. This love for the dogma, the tendency of the academy to enchain, to suffocate, and to vilify, has greatly damaged the countries in which it has prevailed. This has been the cause of delay in the progress of art in Spain. And on account of this system, we see the Spanish artists, those of personal inspiration and haughty spirit, perish there, or emigrate to Paris, looking for a better atmosphere. For, though it is true that there is in Paris also an academic sect that suffocates, one which proclaims that outside of itself there is no salvation, nevertheless art has succeeded in conquering an independence which permits all sorts of attempts at new expression. Art has not died in Spain, or not at least among Spaniards. What is beginning to die is the old tradition, or rather the intransigent traditionalism. And the best proof of it is the notable number of Spanish painters living in Paris, who prosper there, gaining enviable fame, and who at the end will figure among the French glories, instead of adding illustrious names to the already extensive Spanish catalogue. I intend to make these artists known to the American world, describing the work of each one of them, not as I see, feel, and understand it, but as each one of them has conceived it. I want to tell at present of Pablo Picasso from Malaga, who finds himself in the first rank among the innovators, a man who knows what he wants and wants what he knows who has broken with all school prejudices, has opened for himself a wide path, and has already acquired that notoriety which is the first step towards glory. I do not know if he is known in Spain, and if he is, whether they appreciate his efforts and study his works. What I know is that he is a Parisian personality, which constitutes a glorious achievement. I have studied Picasso, both the artist and his work, which was not difficult, for he is a sincere and spontaneous man, who makes no mystery of his ideals, nor the method he employs to realize them. Picasso tries to produce with his work an impression, not with the subject, but the manner in which he expresses it. He receives a direct impression from external nature he analyzes, develops, and translates it, and afterwards executes it in his own particular style, with the intention that the picture should be the pictorial equivalent of the emotion produced by nature. In presenting his work, he wants the spectator to look for the emotion or idea generated from the spectacle, and not the spectacle itself. From this to the psychology of form there is but one step, and the artist has given it resolutely and deliberately. Instead of the physical manifestation, he seeks in form the psychic one, and on account of his peculiar temperament, his physical manifestations inspire him with geometrical sensations. When he paints, he does not limit himself to taking from an object only those planes which the eye perceives, but deals with all those which, according to him, constitute the individuality of form, 
and with his peculiar fantasy he develops and transforms them and this suggests to him new impressions which he manifests with new forms because from the idea of the representation of a being a new being is born perhaps different from the first one and this becomes the represented being each one of his paintings is the coefficient of the impressions that form has performed in his spirit and in these paintings the public must see the realization of an artistic ideal and must judge them by the abstract sensation they produce without trying to look for the factors that entered into the composition of the final result as it is not his purpose to perpetuate on the canvas an aspect of external nature by which to produce an artistic impression but to represent with the brush the impression he has directly received from nature synthesized by his fantasy he does not put on the canvas the remembrance of a past sensation but describes a present sensation picasso has a different conception of perspective from that in use by the traditionalists according to his way of thinking and painting form must be represented in its intrinsic value and not in relation to other objects he does not think it right to paint a child in size far larger than that of a man just because the child is in the foreground and one wants to indicate that the man is some distance away from it the painting of distance to which the academic school subordinates everything seems to him an element which might be of great importance in a topographical plan or in a geographical map but false and useless in a work of art in his paintings perspective does not exist in them there is nothing but harmonies suggested by form and registers which succeed themselves to compose a general harmony which fills the rectangle that constitutes the picture following the same philosophical system in dealing with light as the one he follows in regard to form to him color does not exist but only the effects of light this produces in matter certain vibrations which produce in the individual certain impressions from this it results that picasso's painting presents to us the evolution by which light and form have operated in developing themselves in his brain to produce the idea and his composition is nothing but the synthetic expression of his emotions those who have studied egyptian art without greco-roman prejudices know that the sons of the nile and the desert sought in their works the realization of an ideal conceived by meditation before the mysterious river and by ecstasy before the imposing solitude and that is why they transformed matter into form and gave to substance the reflection of that which exists only in essence something of this sort happens in picasso's work which is the artistic representation of a psychology of form in which he tries to represent in essence what seems to exist only in substance and likewise just as when we contemplate part of a gothic cathedral we feel an abstract sensation produced by an ensemble of geometrical figures whose significance we do not perceive and whose real form we do not understand immediately so the paintings of picasso have the tendency to produce a similar effect they compel the spectator to forget the beings and objects which are the base of the picture and whose representation is the highest state to which his fantasy has been able to carry them through a geometrical evolution according to his judgment all the races as represented in their artistic exponents have tried to represent form through a fantastic aspect modifying it to adapt it to the idea they wanted to express and at the bottom 
all of them have pursued the same artistic ideal with a tendency similar to his own technique. Marius de Zayas. End of Pablo Picasso by Marius de Zayas from the April July issue of Camera Work, 1911. Read for LibriVox by Sue Anderson. Voyager 1 Encounters Saturn by National Aeronautics and Space Administration. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Voyager 1 Encounters Saturn by National Aeronautics and Space Administration forward the pictures assembled in this publication are a part of the rich and varied harvest of information returned by voyager one across nearly a billion miles of interplanetary space these images are of great beauty as well as great scientific interest serving to remind us of the awesome and breathtaking dimensions of the solar system we inhabit voyager is providing intriguing new information which should help us to understand how the earth and possibly the universe was formed already there have been surprises and puzzles that paint a completely new picture of saturn and its neighborhood including the discovery of three new moons startling information about saturn's rings and observation of the unexpectedly complex structure of saturn's atmosphere and that of its largest moon titan it will take years for scientists to assimilate completely the information which is cascading down from voyager what more will this marvel of technology have to tell us before it departs the solar system to travel endlessly among the stars robert a frosch administrator national aeronautics and space administration december nineteen eighty the date of each photograph and the distance of the spacecraft from the planet or satellite are included with each picture for sale by the superintendent of documents u s government printing office washington d c two zero four o two stock number zero three three dash zero 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 dash zero zero eight one seven dash one illustration Voyager 1 was launched from Cape Canaveral, Florida, on September 5, 1977, beginning its journey to Jupiter, Saturn, and beyond. Introduction No other generation has had the opportunity or the technology to reach beyond our world, to see, to touch, to hear the forces that shape our universe. In slightly over two decades, man has ingeniously explored five distant planets and two dozen moons we have seen their weather and surfaces landed on some probed the atmosphere of others and listened to their radio noises under the planetary exploration program of the national aeronautics and space administration the voyager mission begun in nineteen seventy two was designed to explore jupiter saturn their satellites rings magnetic fields and interplanetary space two automated reprogrammable spacecraft voyagers one and two were launched in late summer of nineteen seventy seven their goals the outer planets both spacecraft made astounding discoveries in the jupiter system in nineteen seventy nine a thin ring a thick ionized sulphur and oxygen torus an actively volcanic satellite these were but a few of the treasures yielded by the two jupiter flybys now voyager one has completed exploration of its final target the ringed planet saturn and its enigmatic giant satellite titan true to the generally unpredictable nature of planetary exploration the treasures of the saturn system far exceeded all expectations we learned more about saturn in one week than in all of recorded history thanks to one trusty robot no larger than a compact car and to thousands of diligent and imaginative people 
both spacecraft carry an assortment of optical radiometric and fields and particle sensing instruments taken together their data present a comprehensive picture of a planetary system and clues to what is happening what has happened and what may happen in our universe this publication presents the preliminary photographic results of voyager one's encounter with saturn and its major satellites voyager one transmitted over seventeen thousand five hundred images in its four months of close observations of the system many of these images have been combined to produce mosaics and color pictures hundreds have yet to be closely examined the second voyager spacecraft will begin its close saturn observations in early june nineteen eighty one and make its closest approach to the planet's northern hemisphere on august twenty fifth then due to its launch during a period of rare planetary alignment occurring only once every one hundred and seventy five years voyager two will be able to continue on to a rendezvous with the seventh planet uranus in january nineteen eighty six and perhaps even the eighth planet neptune in august nineteen eighty nine voyager one's primary mission is complete but its usefulness is far from over as we go about our daily business voyager one is searching for another frontier the edge of our solar system in seven to fifteen years the spacecraft will cross the heliopause the farthest reaches of our sun's magnetic field influence then high above our ecliptic plane voyager one will continue its flight toward the star alpha ophiuchus eventually voyager one will be too distant to communicate with earth and will silently drift in space forever andrew j stofan acting associate administrator for space science national aeronautics and space administration the planet illustration eleven five a nine million kilometers five point five million miles saturn is the sixth planet from the sun and second largest in our solar system like jupiter it is a giant sphere of gas mostly hydrogen and helium with a possible core of rocky material various features in saturn's cloud tops are visible in the accompanying color enhanced image of the planet's northern hemisphere small-scale convective cloud features similar to but much larger than thunderstorms in earth's atmosphere are visible in the brown belt an isolated convective cloud with a dark ring is visible in the light brown zone and a longitudinal wave is visible in the light blue region illustration nine seventeen eighty seventy six million kilometers forty seven million miles as voyager one approached saturn a series of dark and light cloud bands belts and zones became apparent in the planet's northern hemisphere through a high altitude atmospheric haze the planet's shadow obscures the rings behind and immediately to the east of the disk in addition the shadow of the rings on the planet's disk can be seen just north of the rings themselves as they cross in front of the planet six of saturn's fifteen known satellites are visible saturn's largest moon titan considerably larger than earth's moon is clearly visible in the upper left corner the smaller satellites dion tethys and rhea are shown in the lower left corner upper middle and lower respectively two of the innermost moons mimas and enceladus appear to the right of the planet mimas is the one closer to the planet these six moons orbit saturn in the equatorial plane and appear in their present positions because voyager is above that plane illustration ten eighteen eighty thirty four million kilometers twenty one million miles the north temperate belt is visible as the violet colored belt in this false color photograph in this image features which are especially bright in ultraviolet light 
appear as turquoise and violet while ultraviolet dark areas appear orange notice in particular the three spots two bright orange and one pale violet at mid-northern latitudes the bright spots are similar to those shown at much higher resolution in later images the distinct color difference between the north equatorial belt and saturn's other belts and zones may be due to a thick haze layer covering the northern portion of the belt it is not yet understood why the southern hemisphere of the planet below the rings appears bluer than the northern hemisphere color spots in the rings are artifacts of image processing illustration ten thirty eighty eighteen million kilometers eleven million miles saturn's soft velvety appearance and previously unseen detail in its mysterious rings became visible as voyager one approached the planet for example a gap in the dark sea ring is now visible and material can be seen within the relatively wide cassini division long believed to be empty which separates the b ring middle from the a ring outer the egg division appears near the outer edge of the a ring detail can be seen within the shadow cast by the rings upon the planet the broad dark band near the equator is the shadow of the b ring the thinner brighter line just to the south is the shadow of the less dense a ring three of saturn's moons tethys outer left enceladus inner left and mimus right are also visible in this computer mosaic of voyager one images illustration eleven six eighty eight point five million kilometers five point three million miles an unusual red oval cloud feature similar to but smaller than jupiter's great red spot was discovered in the southern hemisphere of saturn the oval six thousand kilometers four thousand miles in length is located at fifty five degrees south latitude the difference in color between the red oval and the surrounding bluish clouds in these two false color images indicates that material within the oval contains a substance that absorbs more blue and violet light than the bluish clouds voyager scientists first observed the oval in august nineteen eighty and the feature has retained its appearance since its discovery illustration eleven six eighty eight million kilometers five million miles in this photograph the shadow of the satellite dion is seen as a dark circle on the face of the planet illustration eleven ten eighty three point five million kilometers two point two million miles a ribbon-like wave structure and small convective features marking a westward jet stream above the wave are visible in this photograph of saturn's cloud tops the view extending from forty degrees to sixty degrees north latitude shows features sixty five kilometers forty miles in diameter measurements in images such as this one indicate that saturn has fewer east to west wind currents than does jupiter illustration eleven twelve eighty four hundred and forty two thousand kilometers two hundred and sixty five thousand miles numerous small cloud features were photographed as voyager one passed above saturn's southern hemisphere at these polar latitudes the large-scale light and dark bands break down into small-scale features seen here as waves and eddies illustration eleven seven eighty seven point five million kilometers four point six million miles two brown ovals approximately ten thousand kilometers six thousand miles across were discovered in saturn's northern hemisphere at about forty degrees and sixty degrees latitude the polar oval upper left has a structure similar to saturn's red oval located in the southern polar latitudes detail within the ovals is not visible at this resolution so it is not yet known if they are 
rotating features similar to the many spots in jupiter's atmosphere the rings illustration eleven twelve eighty seven hundred and seventeen thousand kilometers four hundred and forty four thousand miles the rings of saturn have amazed and intrigued astronomers for over three hundred years now that we have seen them up close they are even more astonishing although they stretch over sixty five thousand kilometers forty thousand miles they may be only a few kilometers thick the ring particles from a few microns to a meter three feet in size have been described as icy snowballs or ice-covered rock voyager scientists continue to pore over their data searching for answers to the puzzles of the rings the rings were named in order of their discovery so the labels do not indicate their relative positions from the planet outward they are known as d c b a f and e illustration ten twenty five eighty twenty four million kilometers fifteen million miles extraordinarily complex structure is seen across the entire span of saturn's ring system the sequence taken approximately every fifteen minutes as voyager one approached saturn proceeds from top to bottom in each column and shows radial spokes rotating within the b-ring the spokes may be caused by a combination of magnetic and electrostatic forces illustration eleven six eighty eight million kilometers five million miles over ninety five individual concentric features can be counted the final count in higher resolution images may be anywhere from five hundred to one thousand separate rings a few of the ringlets shown in this computer assembled mosaic are not concentric circles but are instead elliptical ring particles are probably ice or ice covered rock illustration the classic features of the rings are illustrated in the diagram d ring c ring b ring spoke cassini division ink division a ring f ring illustration eleven eight eighty six million kilometers three point seven million miles the cassini division is filled with numerous ringlets discovered by cassini in 1675 this area between the a and b rings had long been thought devoid of material the voyager observation of well-defined rings within the cassini division was an unexpected discovery illustration eleven twelve eighty seven hundred forty thousand kilometers four hundred and sixty thousand miles saturn's ring system viewed from below appears dramatically different from its appearance on the sunlit side this computer processed image shows the f ring circling outside the a ring the a ring with its anchored division the multiple ringlets in the cassini division and the optically thick b ring seen here in magenta hues the coloration is an artifact of processing and is not real the b ring appears dark from below the ring plane because it is dense enough to reflect most of the sunlight causing it to appear very bright when seen from the sunward side the opaline brightness of the cassini division here indicates a great deal of sunlight being scattered through this region the ink division may really be empty since it appears dark from both above and below illustration eleven twelve eighty seven hundred and twenty thousand kilometers four hundred and fifty thousand miles outbound and above the ring plane voyager one gave us this view of saturn's rings eight hours after its closest approach to the planet the unique lighting accentuates the many hundreds of bright and dark ringlets comprising the ring system the c ring dark gray area seems to blend into the brighter b ring as the concentric features radiate out from the planet the dark spoke-like features seen in images taken during the approach to saturn now appear as bright streaks indicating that they may be composed of small particles illustration 
eleven twelve eighty seven hundred and fifty thousand kilometers four hundred and seventy thousand miles two narrow braided rings in the f ring are evident in this view as well as a broader very diffuse component about thirty five kilometers twenty miles across a totally unexpected discovery the braided rings trace distinctly separate orbits intertwining each other the knots may be local clumps of ring material or tiny moons it is difficult to explain this complicated structure using only the gravitational forces known to be affecting the particles of this ring it is possible that additional electrostatic forces may also influence these particles illustration eleven eight eighty seven million kilometers four point three million miles brightness variations in the f ring may be due to clumping in the ring material the features are seen at the top and again near the left edge of the ring in this image the gap in the ring left center is not real but is the location of a rizzo mark on the camera's vidicon tube these bright features in the f ring appear to move at the orbital rate of the ring particles and may be larger bodies or thicknesses in the rings saturn's thirteenth and fourteenth satellites which orbit on either side of the f ring may act like sheep dogs herding the f ring particles between them less than one hundred kilometers sixty miles wide the f ring is located outside of the a ring satellite fourteen discovered by voyager one is seen just inside the f ring the satellites in only twelve hours saturn's satellites grew from names in ancient mythology into dazzling worlds with personae of their own as voyager one sailed through the saturn system it returned photographs of mimas enceladus tethys dion and rhea all part of a class of intermediate-sized icy bodies heretofore unstudied by planetary spacecraft all but enceladus show heavily cratered surfaces evidence of eons of meteorite bombardment enceladus hints at internal processes as yet unidentified which may have erased from its surface the evidence of early bombardment but we must await voyager two's arrival next august to better understand this body illustration eleven nine eighty four point five million kilometers two point eight million miles the surface of giant titan now dethroned from its seat as the solar system's largest satellite jupiter's ganymede is larger remains an enigma shrouded beneath thick layers of haze illustration eleven twelve eighty twenty two thousand kilometers fourteen thousand miles tiny moons three new ones and three confirmed from previous sightings may tell us much about ring dynamics since gravitational forces from satellites probably influence the ring structure two of these tiny moons are on the verge of collision in the same orbit while several others appear to bound the a and f rings iapetus whose two hemispheres differ dramatically in brightness was photographed in its orbit almost three point six million kilometers two point two million miles from the planet illustration eleven twelve eighty four hundred and twenty five thousand kilometers two hundred and sixty four thousand miles mimas saturn's innermost large satellite has an impact crater covering more than one quarter the diameter of the entire moon nowhere else in the solar system has such a disproportionately large feature been seen in fact it is believed that any impact larger than this would probably have shattered mamus into two or more fragments the crater has a raised rim and central peak typical of large impact structures on terrestrial planets additional smaller craters fifteen to forty five kilometers ten to thirty miles in diameter can be seen scattered across the surface particularly along the terminator mamus is one of the small low-density saturnian 
satellites implying that it is composed primarily of ice illustration eleven twelve eighty one hundred thirty thousand kilometers eighty thousand miles mimas's other side shows a uniformly and heavily cratered surface a record of the bombardment that occurred throughout the solar system in its early history four point five billion years ago a long narrow trough about five kilometers three miles wide crosses from northeast to southwest mimas's surface is very reflective about sixty per cent indicating that it consists largely of ice which has been chipped and pulverized by eons of meteoritic bombardment such a surface on a small low-mass moon would probably resemble light powdery snow features as small as three kilometers two miles across are visible illustration eleven twelve eighty six hundred and fifty thousand kilometers four hundred thousand miles Enceladus appears to be largely devoid of craters or other major surface relief, suggesting that perhaps internal processes may have erased such structures. This satellite will be seen better by Voyager 2 when it flies past Saturn in August 1981. Illustration 111280, 1.2 million kilometers, 750,000 miles. This heavily cratered surface of Tethys faces toward saturn and includes a large valley about seven hundred and fifty kilometers five hundred miles long and sixty kilometers forty miles wide the craters are the result of impacts and the valley appears to be a large fracture of unknown origin tethys has a diameter of one thousand and fifty kilometers six hundred and fifty miles about one-third that of earth's moon the smallest features visible in this picture are about 24 kilometers, 15 miles across. Illustration, 111280, 700,000 kilometers, 435,000 miles. Dion reveals two distinctly different hemispheres. The photograph shows Dion's trailing side. Bright radiating patterns are probably rays of debris thrown out of impact craters other bright areas may be topographic ridges and valleys illustration eleven twelve eighty a hundred and sixty two thousand kilometers one hundred and one thousand miles dion's other hemisphere mosaic also has many impact craters the record of cosmic collisions the largest crater is less than one hundred kilometers sixty miles in diameter and includes a well-developed central peak sinuous valleys seen near each pole are probably the result of crustal fracturing in the moon's icy crust dion's diameter is only eleven hundred kilometers seven hundred miles much smaller than any of jupiter's icy moons illustration eleven thirteen eighty eighty thousand kilometers fifty thousand miles craters stand shoulder to shoulder on the surface of saturn's satellite rhea seen in this mosaic of the highest resolution pictures of the north polar region rhea is fifteen hundred kilometers nine hundred and fifty miles in diameter and is the most heavily cratered saturn moon the largest crater made by the impact of cosmic debris is about three hundred kilometers a hundred and ninety miles in diameter illustration eleven twelve eighty a hundred and twenty eight thousand kilometers seventy nine thousand five hundred miles impact craters on the ancient surface of rhea closely resemble those on mercury and earth's moon many of the craters have central peaks formed by rebound of the floor during the explosive formation of the crater some craters are old and degraded by later impacts many have sharp rims and appear relatively fresh while others are very shallow and have subdued rims indicative of their antiquity white areas on the edges of several of the craters are probably fresh ice exposed on steep slopes or possibly deposited by volatiles leaking from fractured regions surface features as small as 2.5 kilometers 
one point five miles in diameter are visible illustration eleven nine eighty four point five million kilometers two point eight million miles titan is a large bizarre satellite it is larger almost five thousand one hundred and twenty kilometers or three thousand one hundred and eighty miles in diameter than the planet mercury and possesses a dense atmosphere of unique composition voyager one's cameras show titan's surface to be totally obscured by a thick layer of atmospheric haze in the full disk photograph only two features are visible a faint boundary between the southern and darker northern hemispheres and a dark hood overlying titan's north polar region illustration eleven twelve eighty four hundred thirty five thousand kilometers two hundred seventy thousand miles this hood and greater detail in the haze layers are shown in a higher resolution photograph illustration eleven ten eighty four point six million kilometers two point eight million miles little detail can be seen in this distant view of hyperion the satellite which orbits just beyond titan voyager two will observe hyperion at a closer range illustration eleven twelve eighty three point two million kilometers one point nine million miles saturn's satellite iapetus displays a large circular feature about two hundred kilometers a hundred twenty miles across with a dark spot in its center the circular feature is probably a large impact structure outlined by dark material possibly thrown out by the impact the satellite's leading hemisphere is to the left and the trailing hemisphere which is four to five times brighter is to the right iapetus diameter is one thousand four hundred fifty kilometers nine hundred miles illustration eleven twelve eighty a hundred and seventy seven thousand kilometers one hundred and ten thousand miles two satellites saturn's tenth and eleventh revolve in nearly identical orbits a hundred and fifty one thousand kilometers ninety four thousand miles from saturn's center the satellites are each one hundred to two hundred kilometers in diameter larger than the distance separating their orbits and they are currently approaching one another at a rate which promises collision in about two years such a collision however will probably be averted by orbital changes induced by the satellite's mutual gravitational interactions as they near one another the trailing co-orbital satellite seen in this photograph has a very irregular outline the sun is shining from the left this color composite was produced from three exposures taken over a period of more than six minutes during this period a thin shadow cast by a previously unknown ring moved across the satellite causing the rainbow pattern shown here illustration ten twenty five eighty twenty five million kilometers sixteen million miles two smaller satellites saturn's thirteenth and fourteenth moons were discovered on october twenty fifth nineteen eighty in images taken to study the dark spokes within saturn's b ring the smaller inner satellite has a diameter of about five hundred kilometers three hundred miles and is visible just outside the a ring near the bottom of the picture it travels in an orbit between the a ring and the f ring not visible in this photograph the second satellite seen to the left travels just outside the f ring and is about six hundred kilometers four hundred miles in diameter scientists believe the dimensions of the narrow f ring may be determined by these two satellites which orbit on either edge of the ring a glimpse back illustration eleven thirteen eighty one point five million kilometers nine hundred thirty thousand miles looking back at the saturn system as it soared upward and outward voyager one continued its observations for nearly five weeks after closest saturn approach the spacecraft photographed the planet's sunlit crescent the rain shadows falling on the planet and saturn's dark hemisphere illuminated by ring shine it searched for lightning and auroras on the planet's dark side 
and looked for sun-dogs resulting from ammonia crystals in the atmosphere it continued temperature and composition measurements and search for new satellites out to the orbit of mimas it measured the flow of plasma in saturn's magnetosphere and now its journey far from over voyager one proceeds toward the outer boundary of our solar system as it seeks to probe the space among the stars of our galaxy the milky way illustration eleven sixteen eighty five point three million kilometers three point three million miles departing saturn voyager one photographed the planet from a unique perspective clearly showing saturn's shadow on the rings illustration eleven twelve eighty two hundred and fifty thousand kilometers a hundred and fifty thousand miles during a forty-minute period on the day of encounter the spacecraft was itself in the planet's shadow at this time the wide-angle camera acquired a photograph of the shadow line revealing ring material in a region very close to the planet where no material had been previously observed this inner ring the d ring is roughly six thousand kilometers four thousand miles wide and extends to within about six thousand kilometers of saturn's cloud tops the voyager mission only once every a hundred and seventy five years are the outer planets aligned in their orbits so that we can take advantage of gravity assist trajectories to achieve encounters with jupiter saturn uranus and neptune on one mission the gravity assist technique uses one planet's gravity field and motion through space to alter the spacecraft's flight path and propel it outward toward the next planet voyager one's trajectory which was selected to best view titan has now propelled the spacecraft out of the ecliptic plane while voyager two's path will remain in this plane to provide future encounters with uranus and possibly with neptune mission objectives the voyager project was approved in june nineteen seventy two and had as its mission objectives exploration of the jupiter and saturn planetary systems including their atmospheres rings satellites and magnetospheres comparative analyses of the two systems investigation of the interplanetary medium between earth and saturn a fourth objective added in nineteen seventy six was to preserve the possibility of extending the mission to include an investigation of the planet uranus and the interstellar medium with the completion of voyager one's saturn flyby it is now clear that these objectives will be achieved spacecraft characteristics two identical spacecraft were developed for the nineteen seventy seven launch opportunity these marvelous machines were cleverly designed to survive the rigors of long voyages in outer space and to deliver high-quality scientific information required for detailed understanding of planetary systems the spacecraft are both complex automatically responding to their earthbound monitors that remotely control them via radio commands and highly autonomous capable of caring for themselves in many areas through a system of sensors computers and spare equipment each spacecraft functions on about four hundred watts of electrical power which is provided by nuclear generators broadcasts of data across a billion miles to earth are accomplished with a spacecraft transmitter power of only about twenty five watts the amount of energy required by a small household light bulb voyager's scientific payload was carefully chosen to observe saturn over a wide range of wavelengths and to measure magnetic fields charged particles and plasma waves saturn encounter illustration voyager one approached within one hundred twenty four thousand kilometers seventy seven thousand miles of saturn's cloud tops six of the satellites that were photographed are shown in their approximate positions at closest approach by the spacecraft titan dion tethys mamos and Saladus, rhea voyager one's saturn encounter period began on august twenty second nineteen eighty 
at a range of one hundred and nine million kilometers sixty eight million miles from the planet even at this great distance voyagers images were better than any from earth-based telescopes during the long encounter period which extended through december nineteenth nineteen eighty continuous observations of saturn's realm were carried out by voyager's instruments voyager one's flight path through the saturn system demanded navigation of the highest precision to meet three critical targets one a close four thousand kilometer two thousand three hundred mile flyby and occultation at titan two a precise three-minute time period when the spacecraft was emerging from occultation at the same time earth was in a position to receive the spacecraft signals passing through the gap between saturn and its rings and three a flight path through the e-ring at theon's orbit to assure safe passage through a zone clear of potentially dangerous material to assure these targets were achieved small trajectory trim maneuvers were executed on october eleventh nineteen eighty and again on november sixth nineteen eighty as voyager one sped toward saturn illustration voyager spacecraft and scientific instruments high gain antenna three point seven meter diameter low energy charged particle cosmic ray plasma imaging ultraviolet spectrometer infrared interferometer spectrometer photopolarimeter optical calibration target planetary radio astronomy and plasma wave antenna two radio isotope thermoelectric generator three magnetometer boom by october twenty fourth nineteen eighty when voyager one was about thirty million kilometers ninety million miles from saturn the spacecraft's narrow angle camera could no longer capture the planet in a single picture thus a period of multiple images or mosaics began by november second nineteen eighty even four picture mosaics could no longer cover the rapidly growing scene voyager one's pace of operations reached an exciting peak during the near encounter phase from november eleventh through november thirteenth nineteen eighty while still about one point six million kilometers one million miles from closest approach to saturn voyager one encountered titan on november eleventh nineteen eighty and then dipped below the ring plane as it accelerated rapidly toward saturn on november twelfth nineteen eighty voyager one came within a hundred and twenty four thousand kilometers seventy seven thousand miles of the cloud tops of saturn's southern hemisphere where saturn's gravity altered the spacecraft's course hurtling the spacecraft upward past the ring plane close observation of saturn's other major satellites and its rings were made during this passage from earth to saturn voyager one has traveled in the ecliptic plane the plane in which the major planets orbit now having completed its final planetary flyby voyager one is rising above this plane on a trajectory that will eventually carry it above and out of the solar system probably before the end of the century as it proceeds the spacecraft will return information about the solar wind and magnetic fields in the far unexplored reaches of our solar system and will observe cosmic rays emitted from the distant stars among which voyager will ultimately cruise scientific highlights some of the most important information gathered by voyager one on the saturn system is presented pictorially in this publication and is supplemented here with brief summaries of the major discoveries observations and theories saturn saturn's atmosphere appears similar to jupiter's with alternating dark belts and bright zones circulating storm regions and other dark and light cloud markings saturn's belt and zone system extends to higher latitudes than those on jupiter and all of the features are muted by a thick atmospheric haze perhaps seventy kilometers 
forty miles deep wind speeds up to fifteen hundred kilometers per hour nine hundred miles per hour occur at the equator four to five times faster than any jovian winds temperatures near the cloud tops range from eighty six to ninety two kelvins minus three hundred and five degrees to minus two hundred and ninety four degrees fahrenheit nearly sixty degrees colder than at jupiter saturn still radiates about two point eight times as much heat as it receives from the sun the coolest temperatures are found at the center of the equatorial zone auroral emissions have been seen near saturn's poles and auroral type emissions have been seen in ultraviolet light near the illuminated limb of the planet lightning bolts have not been seen on saturn but radio emissions typical of lightning discharges have been recorded the source of these discharges is believed to be the rings rather than saturn's atmosphere rings hundreds of tiny ringlets a few of them elliptical rather than circular comprise the classic a b and c rings once thought to be uniform disks of material the f ring which was first sighted by pioneer eleven in nineteen seventy nine was observed to be three separate intertwined ringlets the existence of a d ring between the c ring and the planet has been confirmed by observations during voyager one's passage through saturn's shadow the tenuous e ring previously observed from earth only when saturn's rings could be viewed edge on every fifteen years has also been observed during shadowed passage at least one other ring has been found between the e and f rings in voyager images long radial spoke-like features in the b ring were dark when viewed upon approach and bright when observed after encounter when the spacecraft looked back toward the planet and the sun new satellites voyager one photographed six tiny moons some that had never been seen before satellites ten and eleven dubbed the co-orbitals share an orbit ninety one thousand kilometers fifty seven thousand miles above saturn's cloud tops the leading satellite has a diameter of about one hundred and sixty kilometers one hundred miles while the trailing satellite has an irregular shape approximately one hundred and five by sixty five kilometers sixty five by forty miles little is known about satellites twelve thirteen fourteen and fifteen aside from their orbits and periods satellite twelve orbits at the same distance from saturn as dion at a point about sixty degrees ahead of dion satellites thirteen and fourteen outside and inside the f ring respectively appear to herd this thin ring between them satellite fifteen appears to limit the outer edge of the a ring in a similar manner inner satellites mimos enceladus tethys dion and rhea represent a body size not previously explored by spacecraft they are larger than jupiter's amalthea and mars's phobos and deimos yet smaller than mercury our moon or jupiter's large satellites their diameters range from three hundred and ninety kilometers two hundred and forty miles for mimos to fifteen hundred thirty kilometers nine hundred and fifty miles for rhea and they are probably composed primarily of water ice with the exception of enceladus all of these moons have heavily cratered surfaces looking much like the moon and mercury mimas displays an impact crater whose diameter is one-fourth that of the satellite such an impact must have nearly shattered the icy satellite tethys has a valley seventy kilometers forty miles wide that stretches eight hundred kilometers five hundred miles across the satellite an apparent crustal fracture resulting from seismic activity several sinuous valleys some of which appear to branch are visible on dion's surface both dion and rhea have bright wispy streaks on their already highly reflective surfaces perhaps caused by ice thrown out of craters by meteorite impacts 
of the five inner moons enceladus appears the smoothest but we will have to wait for a voyage or two to photograph the satellite at greater resolution in nineteen eighty one since the maximum intensity of the e-ring occurs near enceladus's orbit enceladus may be a source of e-ring particles titan titan is now known to be smaller than jupiter's ganymede its diameter is less than fifty one hundred twenty kilometers thirty one hundred eighty miles which implies a density twice that of water ice a dense hazy atmosphere at least four hundred kilometers two hundred and fifty miles thick obscures the surface voyager one determined that titan has a nitrogen rich atmosphere as does earth but with concentrations of hydrocarbons such as methane natural gas ethane acetylene ethylene and deadly hydrogen cyanide the haze layers merge into a darkened hood over the north pole at the poles liquid nitrogen lakes may form the surface temperature is probably near one hundred kelvins minus two hundred and eighty degrees fahrenheit only slightly warmer than the boiling point of liquid nitrogen titan has no appreciable magnetic field and therefore possesses no large liquid conducting core it does however supply a small amount of charged particles to saturn's magnetosphere the southern hemisphere is somewhat brighter than the northern perhaps as a result of seasonal effects outer satellites of the three known outer satellites voyager one studied from a distance only hyperion and iapetus tiny phoebe in its retrograde clockwise orbit will be studied by voyager two in the summer of nineteen eighty one hyperion and iapetus are most likely composed of water ice although their masses and densities are uncertain iapetus has one bright and one dark hemisphere the dark side which faces forward as iapetus circles saturn reflects about one-fifth as much light as the trailing bright side magnetosphere although it is only about one-third the size of jupiter's magnetosphere saturn's magnetosphere is still an enormous structure extending nearly two million kilometers from the planet toward the sun the size of the magnetosphere fluctuates rhythmically as the flow of charged particles in the solar wind increases or decreases in intensity the magnetosphere can be pushed inside titan's orbit so that at times the satellite finds itself outside of the magnetosphere altogether charged particles in the planet's magnetosphere are dragged along by the magnetic field circling the planet at saturn's rotation rate of ten hours thirty nine minutes these charged particles whiz by titan at a dizzying rate of more than two hundred kilometers a hundred and twenty miles per second titan leaves a motorboat like wake in its orbital path extending from the orbit of titan inward to the orbit of rhea an enormous cloud of uncharged hydrogen atoms forms a donut-shaped torus of ultraviolet emitting particles because of their neutrality these atoms are not towed around by saturn's magnetic field close to the planet saturn's rings act as an effective shield or absorber of charged particles the rings themselves are apparently substantially affected in this process however as evidenced by their spokes of fine particles and the lightning-like electrical discharges attributed to the rings our voyager knew marvelously the laws of gravitation and all attractive and repulsive forces he used them in such a timely way that once with the help of a ray of sunshine another time thanks to a cooperative comet he went from globe to globe he and his kin as a bird flutters from branch to branch voltaire micromegas histoire philosophique seventeen fifty two national aeronautics and space administration jet propulsion laboratory california institute of technology pasadena california j p l four hundred dash one hundred twelve slash eighty
End of Voyager 1 Encounter Saturn by National Aeronautics and Space Administration. Waterfront Fancies by Ben Hecht from A Thousand and One Afternoons in Chicago. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Matt Perard. Man's capacity for faith is infinite. He is able to believe with passion in things invisible. He can achieve a fantastic confidence in the unknowable. Here he sits on the breakwater near the municipal pier, a fishpole in his hand, staring patiently into the agate-colored water. He can see nothing. The lake is enormous. It contains thousands of square miles of water. And yet this man is possessed of an unshakable faith that by some mysterious ledger main of chance, a fish with 10,000 square miles of water to swim in safely will seek out the little minnow less than an inch in length which he has lowered beside the breakwater and so the victim of the preposterous conviction he sits and eyes the tip of his fish pole with unflagging hope it is warm the sun spreads a brightly colored but uncomfortable woolen blanket over their heads a tepid breeze reminiscent of cinders whirl idly over the warm cement strung along the pier are a hundred figures all in identical postures they sit in defiance of all logic, all mathematics. For it is easy to calculate that if there are a half million fish in Lake Michigan, and each fish displaces less than five cubic inches of water, there would be only two and a half million cubic inches of fish altogether lost in an expanse containing at least 800 billion cubic inches of water therefore the chance of one fish being at any one particular spot are one in four hundred thousand in other words the odds against each of these strangely patient men watching the ends of their fish poles the odds against their catching a fish are four hundred thousand to one it is therefore somewhat amazing to stand and watch what happens along the sunny breakwater every three minutes one of the poles jerks out of the water with a wriggling prize on the hook how are they coming we ask oh so so answers one of the fishermen and points mutely to a string of several dozen perch floating under his feet in the water thus does man by virtue of his faith rise above the science of mathematics and the barriers of logic thus in his fantastic belief in things unseen and easily disproved vindicated he catches fish whereby the law of probabilities there should be no fish with the whole lake stretching mockingly before him he sits consumed with a preposterous a fanatical faith in the little half-inch minnow dangling at the end of his line the hours pass the sun grows hotter the piles of stone and steel along the lake front seem to waver from the distant streets come faint noises on a hot day the city is as appealing as a half-cooled cinder patch poor devils in factories poor devils in stores in offices one must sigh thinking of them life is even vaster than the lake in which these fishermen fish and happiness is mathematically elusive as the fish for which the fishermen wait and yet an old man with a battered face a young man with a battered face silent stoical battered-looking men with fish poles a hundred two hundred they sit staring into the water of the lake as if they were looking for something for fish incredible one does not sit like this watching for something to become visible why because then there would be an air of suspense about the watcher he would grow nervous after an hour when the thing remained still invisible and finally he would fall into hysterics and unquestionably shriek and these men grow calmer then what are they looking at hour after hour under the hot sun nothing they are letting the rhythm of water and sky lull them into a sleep a surcease from living this is a very poetical thing for a hundred battered-looking men to attempt yet life may be as intimidating to honest 
unimaginative ones as to their self-styled superiors there are many types fishing but all of them look soiled idlers workers unhappy ones they come to forget to let the agate eye of the lake stare them into a few hours of oblivion but there is something else long ago men hunted and fished to keep alive they fought with animals and sat with empty stomachs staring at the water not in quest of nirvanas but of fish so now after ages and ages have passed there is left a vague memory of this in the minds of these fishermen this memory makes them still feel a certain thrill in the business of pursuit even as they sit stoical and inanimate forgetful of unpaid bills unfinished and never to be finished plans there comes this curious thrill a mouth tugs at the little minnow the pole jerks electrically in the hand something alive is on the hook and the fisherman for an instant recovers his past he is ab fighting with an evening meal off the coast of wales two glacial periods ago his body quivers his muscles set his eyes flash zip the line leaps out of the water another monster of the deep whose conquest is necessary for the survival of the race of man has been overcome there he hangs writhing on a hook there he swings toward his triumphant foe and the hand of the fisherman on the municipal breakwater trembling with mysterious elation closes about the wet firm body of an outraged perch a make-believe hunt that now bears the name of sport yes but not always here is one with a red battered face and a curiously practical air about him he is putting his fish in a basket and counting them two dozen perch want to sell them he shakes his head what are you going to do with them he looks up and grins slowly then he points to his lips with his fingers and makes signs this means he is dumb he places his hand over his stomach and grins again he is going to eat them it is time to go home and do this so he puts up his fish pole and packs his primitive paraphernalia a tin can a rusty spike a bamboo pole here is one then who in the heart of the still forest called civilization still seeks out long-forgotten ways of keeping life in his body he hunts for fish the sun slides down the sky the fishermen begin to pack up they walk with their heads down and bent forward like number sevens they raise their eyes occasionally to the piles of stone and steel that mark the city front back to their troubles and their cinder patch but and this is a curious fact their eyes gleam with hope and curiosity End of Waterfront Fancies by Ben Hatt. My Life and Work by Henry Ford. Chapter 2 What I Learned About Business. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Robert Robinson. My gasoline buggy was the first and for a long time the only automobile in Detroit. It was considered to be something of a nuisance, for it made a racket and it scared horses. It also blocked traffic. For, if I stopped my machine anywhere in town, a crowd was around it before I could start up again. If I left it alone, even for a minute, some inquisitive person always tried to run it. Finally, I had to carry a chain and chain it to a lamp post wherever I left it anywhere. And then there was trouble with the police. I do not know quite why, for my impression is that there were no speed limit laws in those days. Anyway, I had to get a special permit from the mayor, and thus, for a time, enjoyed the distinction of being the only licensed chauffeur in America. I ran that machine about 1,000 miles through 1895 and 1896, and then sold it to Charles Ainsley of Detroit for $200. That was my first sale. I had built the car not to sell, but only to experiment with. I wanted to start another car. Ainsley wanted to buy, I could use the money, and we had no trouble in agreeing upon a price. It was not at all my idea to make cars in any such petty fashion. I was looking ahead to production, but before that could come I had to have something to produce. It does not pay to hurry. I started a second car in 1896. It was much like the first, but a little lighter. 
It also had the belt drive, which I did not give up until some time later. The belts were all right, excepting in hot weather. That is why I later adopted gears. I learned a great deal from that car. Others in this country and abroad were building cars by that time, and in 1895, I heard that a Benz car from Germany was on exhibition in Macy's store in New York. I traveled down to look at it, but it had no features that seemed worthwhile. It also had the belt drive, but it was much heavier than my car. I was working for lightness. The foreign makers have never seemed to appreciate what lightweight means. I built three cars at all in my home shop, and all of them ran for years in Detroit. I still have the first car. I bought it back a few years later from a man to whom Mr. Ainsley had sold it. I paid $100 for it. During all this time, I kept my position with the electric company and gradually advanced to chief engineer at a salary of $125 a month. But my gas engine experiments were no more popular with the president of the company than my first mechanical learnings were with my father. It was not that my employer objected to experiments, only to experiments with a gas engine. I can still hear him say, Electricity, yes, that's the coming thing, but gas, no. He had ample grounds for his skepticism, to use the mildest terms. Practically no one had the remotest notion of the future of the internal combustion engine, while we were just on the edge of the great electrical development. As with every comparatively new idea, electricity was expected to do much more than we even now have any indication that it can do. I did not see the use of experimenting with electricity for my purposes. A road car could not run on a trolley even if trolley wires had been less expensive. No storage battery was in sight of a weight that was practical. An electrical car had of necessity to be limited in radius and to contain a large amount of motive machinery in proportion to the power exerted. That is not to say that I held or now hold electricity cheaply. We have not yet begun to use electricity. But it has its place, and the internal combustion engine has its place. Neither can substitute for the other, which is exceedingly fortunate. I have the dynamo that I first had charge of at the Detroit Edison Company. When I started our Canadian plant, I bought it from an office building to which it had been sold by the electric company. Had it revamped a little, and for several years it gave excellent service in the Canadian plant. When we had to build a new power plant owing to increases in business, I had the old motor taken out to my museum, a room out at Dearborn that holds a great number of my mechanical treasures. The Edison Company offered me the general superintendency of the company, but only on condition that I would give up my gas engine and devote myself to something really useful. I had to choose between my job and my automobile. <laughs> I chose the automobile. Or rather, I gave up the job. There really was nothing in the way of a choice, for I already knew that the car was bound to be a success. I quit my job on August 15th, 1899, and went into the automobile business. It might be thought of something of a step, for I had no personal funds. What money was left over from living was all used in experimenting, but my wife agreed that the automobile could not be given up, and that we had to make or break. There was no, quote, demand, unquote, for automobiles. There never is for a new article. They were accepted in much the fashion, as was more recently the airplane. At first, the so-called horseless carriage was considered merely a freak notion, and many wise people explained with particularity why it could never become more than a toy. No man of money even thought of it as a commercial possibility. I cannot imagine why each new means of transportation meets with such opposition. There are even those today who shake their heads and talk about the luxury of the automobile and only grudgingly admit that perhaps the motor truck is of some use. But in the beginning there was hardly anyone who sensed that the automobile could be a large factor in industry. The most optimistic hoped only for a development akin to that of the bicycle. When it was found that an automobile really could go, and several makers started to put out cars, the immediate query was as to which would go fastest. It was a curious but natural development, that racing idea. I never thought anything of racing, but the public refused to consider the automobile in any light other than as a fast toy. Therefore, later, we had to race. The industry was held back by this initial racing slant, for the attention of the makers was diverted to making fast, rather than good, cars. It was a business for speculators. A group of men of speculative turn of mind organized, as soon as I left the electric company, the Detroit Automobile Company to exploit my car. 
I was the chief engineer and held a small amount of the stock. For three years, we continued making cars more or less on the model of my first car. We sold very few of them. I could get no support at all toward making better cars to be sold to the public at large. The whole thought was to make to order and to get the largest price possible for each car. The main idea seemed to be to get the money. And, being without authority other than my engineering position gave me, I found that the new company was not a vehicle for realizing my ideas, but merely a money-making concern. That did not make much money. In March 1902, I resigned, determined never again to put myself under orders. The Detroit Automobile Company later became the Cadillac Company, under the ownership of the Lelands, who came in subsequently. I rented a shop, a one-story brick shed, at 81 Park Place to continue my experiments and to find out what business really was. I thought that it must be something different from what it had proved to be in my first adventure. In the year from 1902 until the formation of the Ford Motor Company was practically one of investigation. In my little one-room brick shop, I worked on the development of a four-cylinder motor, and on the outside, I tried to find out what business really was and whether it needed to be quite so selfish a scramble for money as it seemed to be from my first short experience. From the period of the first car, which I have described, until the formation of my present company, I built in all about 25 cars, of which 19 or 20 were built with the Detroit Automobile Company. The automobile had passed from the initial stage, where the fact that it could run at all was enough, to the stage where it had to show speed. Alexander Winton of Cleveland, the founder of the Winton car, was then the track champion of the country and willing to meet all comers. I designed a two-cylinder enclosed engine of a more compact type than I'd used before, fitted it into a skeleton chassis, found that I could make speed, and arranged a race with Winton. We met on the Gross Point track at Detroit. I beat him. That was my first race, and it brought advertising of the only kind that people cared to read. The public thought nothing of a car unless it made speed, unless it beat other racing cars. My ambition, to build the fastest car in the world, led me to plan a four-cylinder motor, but more of that later. The most surprising feature of business as it was conducted was the large attention given to finance and the small attention to service. That seemed to me to be reversing the natural process, which is that the money should come as the result of work and not before the work. The second feature was the great indifference to better methods of manufacture as long as whatever was done got by and took the money. In other words, an article apparently was not built with reference to how greatly it could serve the public, but with reference solely to how much money could be had for it, and that without any particular care whether the customer was satisfied. To sell him was enough. A dissatisfied customer was regarded not as a man whose trust had been violated, but either as a nuisance or as a possible source of more money in fixing up the work which ought to have been done correctly in the first place. For instance, in automobiles there was not much concern as to what happened to the car once it had been sold. How much gasoline it used per mile was of no great moment, how much service it actually gave did not matter, and if it broke down and had to have parts replaced, then that was just hard luck for the owner. It was considered good business to sell parts at the highest possible price on the theory that, since the man had already bought the car, he simply had to have the part and would be willing to pay for it. The automobile business was not on what I would call an honest basis, to say nothing of being, from a manufacturing standpoint, on a scientific basis, but it was no worse than business in general. That was the period, it may be remembered, in which many corporations were being floated and financed. The bankers, who before then had confined themselves to the railroads, got into industry. My idea was then, and still is, that if a man did his work well, the price he would get for that work, the profits, and all financial matters, would care for themselves, and that a business ought to start small and build itself up and out of its earnings. If there are no earnings, then that's a signal to the owner that he is wasting his time and does not belong in that business. I have never found it necessary to change those ideas, but I discovered that this simple formula of doing good work and getting paid for it was supposed to be slow for modern business. The plan at that time most in favor was to start off with the largest possible capitalization and then sell all the stock and all the bonds that could be sold. 
whatever money happened to be left over, after all the stock and bond selling expenses and promoters, charges and all that, went grudgingly into the foundation of the business. A good business was not one that did good work and earned a fair profit. A good business was one that would give the opportunity for the floating of a large amount of stocks and bonds at high prices. It was the stocks and bonds, not the work, that mattered. I could not see how a new business or an old business could be expected to be able to charge into its product a great big bond interest and then sell the product at a fair price. I have never been able to see that. I have never been able to understand on what theory the original investment of money can be charged against a business. Those men in business who call themselves financiers say that money is quote unquote worth 6% or 5% or some other percent. And that if business has $100,000 invested in it, the man who made the investment is entitled to charge an interest payment on the money. Because if instead of putting that money into the business, he had put it into a savings bank or into certain securities, he could have a certain fixed return. Therefore, they say that a proper charge against the operating expenses of a business is the interest on this money. This idea is at the root of many business failures and most service failures. Money is not worth a particular amount. As money, it's not worth anything, for it will do nothing of itself. The only use of money is to buy tools to work with or the product of those tools. Therefore, money is worth what it will help you to produce or buy and no more. If a man thinks that his money will earn 5% or 6%, he ought to place it where he can get that return. But money placed in a business is not a charge on the business, or rather should not be. It ceases to be money and becomes, or should become, an engine of production. And it is therefore worth what it produces, and not a fixed sum according to some scale which has no bearing on the particular business in which the money has been placed. Any return should come after it has produced, not before. Businessmen believed that you could do anything by financing it. If it did not go through on the first financing, then the idea was to refinance. The process of refinancing was simply the game of sending good money after bad. In the majority of cases, the need of refinancing arises from bad management, and the effect of refinancing is simply to pay the poor managers to keep up their bad management a little longer. It is merely a postponement of the day of judgment. This makeshift of refinancing is a device of speculative financiers. Their money is no good to them unless they can connect it up with a place where real work is being done. And that they cannot do unless, somehow, that place is poorly managed. Thus, the speculative financiers delude themselves that they are putting their money out to use. They are not. They are putting it out to waste. I determined absolutely that never would I join a company in which finance came before the work or in which bankers or financiers had a part. And, further that, if there were no great way to get started in the kind of business that I thought could be managed in the interest of the public, then I simply would not get started at all. For my own short experience, together with what I saw going on around me, was quite enough proof that business as a mere money-making game was not worth giving much thought to, and was distinctly no place for a man who wanted to accomplish anything. Also, it did not seem to me to be the way to make money. I have yet to have it demonstrated that it is the way, for the only foundation of real business is service. A manufacturer is not through with his customer when a sale is completed. He has only then started with his customer. In the case of an automobile, the sale of the machine is only something in the nature of an introduction. If the machine does not give service, then it is better for the manufacturer if he never had the introduction, for he will have the worst of all advertisements, a dissatisfied customer. There was something more than a tendency in the early days of the automobile to regard the selling of a machine as the real accomplishment and that thereafter it did not matter what happened to the buyer. That is the short-sighted salesman on commission attitude. If a salesman is paid only for what he sells, it is not to be expected that he is going to exert any great effort on a customer out of whom no more commission is to be made. And it is right on this point that we later made the largest selling argument for the Ford. The price and quality of the car would undoubtedly have made a market, and a large market. We went beyond that. A man who bought one of our cars was, in my opinion, entitled to continuous use of that car, 
and therefore if he had a breakdown of any kind, it was our duty to see that his machine was put into shape again at the earliest possible moment. In the success of the Ford car, the early provision of service was an outstanding element. Most of the expensive cars of that period were ill-provided with service stations. If your car broke down, you had to depend on the local repairman, when you were entitled to depend on the manufacturer. If the local repairman were a forehanded sort of person, keeping on hand a good stock of parts, although on many of the cars the parts were not interchangeable, the owner was lucky. But if the repairman were a shiftless person, with an adequate knowledge of automobiles and an inordinate desire to make a good thing out of every car that came into his place for repairs, then even a slight breakdown meant weeks of laying up and a whopping big repair bill that had to be paid before the car could be taken away. The repairmen were, for a time, the largest menace to the automobile industry. Even as late as 1910 and 1911, the owner of an automobile was regarded as essentially a rich man whose money ought to be taken away from him. We met that situation squarely and at the very beginning. We would not have our distribution blocked by stupid, greedy men. That is getting some years ahead of the story. But it is control by finance that breaks up service because it looks to the immediate dollar. If the first consideration is to earn a certain amount of money, then, unless by some stroke of luck matters are going especially well, and there is a surplus over for service so that the operating men may have a chance, future business has to be sacrificed for the dollar of today. And also I noticed a tendency among many men in business to feel that their lot was hard. They worked against a day when they might retire and live on an income, get out of the strife. Life to them was a battle to be ended as soon as possible. That was another point I could not understand, for, as I reasoned, life is not a battle except with our own tendency to sag with the downpool of, quote, getting settled, unquote. If to petrify is success, all one has to do is to humor the lazy side of the mind. But if grow is success, then one must wake up anew every morning and keep awake all day. I saw great businesses become but the ghost of a name, because someone thought they could be managed just as they were always managed. And though the management may have been most excellent in its day, its excellence consisted in its alertness to its day, and not in slavish following of its yesterdays. Life, as I see it, is not a location, but a journey. Even the man who most feels himself settled is not settled, he is probably sagging back. Everything is in flux and was meant to be. Life flows. We may live at the same number of the street, but it is never the same man who lives there. And, out of the delusion that life is a battle that may be lost by a false move, grows, I have noticed, a great love for regularity. Men fall into the half-alive habit. Seldom does the cobbler take up with the newfangled way of soling shoes, and seldom does the artisan willingly take up with new methods in his trade. Habit conduces to a certain inertia and any disturbance of it affects the mind like trouble. It will be recalled that when a study was made of shop methods, so that the workmen might be taught to produce with less useless motion and fatigue, I was the most opposed by the workmen themselves. Though they suspected that it was simply a game to get more out of them, what most irked them was that it interfered with the well-worn grooves in which they had become accustomed to move. Businessmen go down with their businesses because they like the old way so well they cannot bring themselves to change. One sees them all about, men who do not know that yesterday is past and who woke up this morning with their last year's ideas. It could almost be written down as a formula that when a man begins to think that he has at last found his method, he had better begin a most searching examination of himself to see whether some part of his brain has not gone to sleep. There is a subtle danger in a man thinking that he is fixed for life. It indicates that the next jolt of the wheel of progress is going to fling him off. There is also a great fear of being thought a fool. So, many men are afraid of being considered fools. I grant that public opinion is a powerful police influence for those who need it. Perhaps it's true that the majority of men need the restraint of public opinion. Public opinion may keep a man better than he would otherwise be, if not better morally, at least better as far as his social desirability is concerned. But it is not a bad thing to be a fool for righteousness' sake. The best of it is that such fools usually live long enough to prove that they were not fools, 
or the work they have begun lives long enough to prove they were not foolish. The money influence, the pressing to make profit on an investment, and its consequent neglect of or skimping of work and hence of service, showed itself to me in many ways. It seemed to be at the bottom of most troubles. It was the cause of low wages, for without well-directed work high wages cannot be paid. And if the whole attention is not given to the work, it cannot be well-directed. Most men want to be free to work. Under the system in use, they could not be free to work. During my first experience, I was not free. I could not give full play to my ideas. Everything had to be planned to make money. The last consideration was the work. And the most curious part of it all was the insistence that it was the money and not the work that counted. It did not seem to strike anyone as illogical that money should be put ahead of work even though everyone had to admit that the profit had to come from the work. The desire seemed to be to find a shortcut to money and pass over the obvious shortcut, which is through the work. Take competition. I found that competition was supposed to be a menace and that a good manager circumvented his competitors by getting a monopoly through artificial means. The idea was that there were only a certain number of people who could buy and that it was necessary to get their trade ahead of someone else. Some will remember that later many of the automobile manufacturers entered into an association under the Selden patent just so that it might be legally possible to control the price and the output of automobiles. They had the same idea that so many trade unions have, the ridiculous notion that more profit can be had doing less work than more. The plan, I believe, is a very antiquated one. I could not see then, and am still unable to see, that there is not always enough for the man who does his work. Time spent in fighting competition is wasted. It had better be spent in doing the work. There are always enough people ready and anxious to buy, provided you supply what they want and at the proper price. And this applies to personal services as well as to goods. During this time of reflection, I was far from idle. We were going ahead with a four-cylinder motor and the building of a pair of big racing cars. I had plenty of time, for I never left my business. I do not believe a man can ever leave his business. He ought to think of it by day and dream of it by night. It is nice to plan to do one's work in office hours, to take up the work in the morning and to drop it in the evening, and not have a care until the next morning. It is perfectly possible to do that, if one is so constituted as to be willing through all of his life to accept direction and to be an employee, possibly a responsible employee, but not a director or a manager of anything. A manual laborer must have a limit on his hours, otherwise he will wear himself out. If he intends to remain always a manual laborer, then he should forget about his work when the whistle blows. But, if he intends to go forward and do anything, the whistle is only a signal to start thinking over the day's work in order to discover how it might be done better. The man who has the largest capacity for work and thought is the man who is bound to succeed. I cannot pretend to say, because I do not know, whether the man who works always, who never leaves his business, who is absolutely intent upon getting ahead, and who therefore does get ahead, is happier than the man who keeps office hours, both for his brain and his hands. It is not necessary for anyone to decide the question. A 10-horsepower engine will not pull as much as a 20. The man who keeps brain office hours limits his horsepower. If he is satisfied only to pull the load that he has, well and good. That is his affair. But he must not complain if another who has increased his horsepower pulls more than he does. Leisure and work bring different results. If a man wants leisure and gets it, then he has no cause to complain. But he cannot have both leisure and the results of work. Concretely, what I most realized about business in that year, and I've been learning more each year without finding it necessary to change my first conclusions, is this. Number one that finance is given a place ahead of work and therefore tends to kill the work and destroy the fundamental of service. Number two, that thinking first of money instead of work brings on fear of failure and this fear blocks every avenue of business. It makes a man afraid of the competition, of changing his methods, or of doing anything which might change his condition. And three, that the way is clear for anyone who thinks first of service, of doing the work in the best possible way. 
End of chapter 2. This recording is in the public domain. Read by Robert Robinson. Winter Butterflies in Bolinas by Mary D. Barber. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Monarch Butterfly, Anosia plexippus, is a familiar object in many parts of the United States. But the fact that it migrates covering in its flights hundreds and even thousands of miles is not generally known this butterfly appears in immense swarms every year early in september at bolinas a sheltered haven on the coast of california about ten miles north of the golden gate a southerly beach walled by high bluffs a quaint little village which consists of trim cottages set in pretty old-fashioned gardens wide stretches of sunny mesa broken here and there by arroyos and groves of cypress trees make up a picturesque landscape while to the south and westward rolls the vast pacific the ceaseless surging of its surf on the smooth sand a never-ending delight to the ear this is the winter home of the monarch butterfly which comes not only from the sierra nevada mountains but also from the western ranges of the rockies on the meadows of these mountains a pale green caterpillar ornamented with glossy black bands feeds on the leaves of the milkweed plant this caterpillar forms a chrysalis about an inch long green spotted with gold the monarch butterfly emerges from this chrysalis unfurls its wings draws its sustenance from the milkweed blossoms lays its eggs and lives happily in the high altitudes till the chill of approaching autumn in the air warns it that the time for migrating has come thousands of these frail butterflies start on their long journey toward the pacific in search of a mild climate free from frost and snow in which they can live all winter fly brown butterflies out to sea frail pale wings for the winds to try small brown wings that we scarce can see fly here and there may a chance caught eye note in a score of you twain or three brighter or darker of tinge or dye some fly light as a laugh of glee some fly soft as a long low sigh all to the heaven where each would be fly in nevada county great flocks of them have been seen following the course of a stream downwards from the mountains toward the sea before they reach the end of their journey they scatter for although they appear in bolinas suddenly and in large numbers no flock has ever been seen approaching in mass the monarch is of a reddish chestnut brown veined with black and bordered with a band of black which is ornamented by two rows of small white spots the underside of the wings is paler an ashy buff color similarly veined and bordered the butterfly is large measuring between four and five inches from tip to tip of outstretched wings when these butterflies arrive the air seems full of them hovering flitting whirling like brown autumn leaves caught in a gust of wind having reached their winter home they swarm on a cypress tree which affords the best shelter during wind and storm each year they come not only to the same grove but to the very same tree and always to the southerly and easterly side of it this tree is within sight and sound of the surf which perhaps reminds the butterflies of the roar of rushing streams and waterfalls in the mountains whence they came is it instinct or scent 
or the climatic advantage of some especial tree which guides them in their choice it is certainly a mystery that a newly arrived flock should choose the identical tree which was the home of their predecessors the winter before for they migrate but to end their days and cannot return to show the way to their progeny which will hatch next spring into stupid caterpillars having no desire but to eat till their time for sleep arrives the instinct or intelligence of the awakened butterfly is inexplicable on sunny days the monarchs feast on the flowers that bloom all winter in the village gardens calla lilies marguerites and heliotrope being their favorites one day a bee and a butterfly were vying with each other for the possession of a marguerite the butterfly alighted on it first but the bee buzzed his way in under the wings of his rival who realizing that his companion was dangerous flew off leaving the bee sole possessor of the coveted flower at evening the monarchs returned to the grove where they may be seen hanging on the cypress branches a tree appears brown as if covered with dead leaves as the butterflies in countless thousands hang close together with folded wings to conserve the warmth of their frail bodies in stormy weather they remain thus dormant for days and even weeks benumbed by the cold yet clinging fast to the branches many however are wrenched from their places of refuge and lie scattered on the ground like a carpet of fallen leaves one evening a number of these which had hardly a spark of life remaining in their water-soaked bodies as they lay on the grass were picked up and brought into the house where a fire of driftwood blazed bright on the hearth the butterflies soon revived in the warm atmosphere hung themselves to the curtains in lieu of trees and went to sleep for the night next morning dawned bright and clear the captive monarchs awakened early and flew away happy when the window was opened to release them the many birds that choose bolinas as their winter home would have a feast if these butterflies were edible but monarchs are protected by an acrid secretion which is distasteful to birds and enjoy a long life on this account living not only all winter but long enough to taste the sweetness of the spring wild flowers the monarchs are great migrants they have crossed the pacific ocean probably on ships and have reached the philippine islands and australia when on a yacht bound for the farallone islands members of the party saw one of these butterflies soaring over the ocean about ten miles from shore it did not rest on the boat but with wings spread before the east wind it sped away following the path of the setting sun like a soul in quest of the ideal that evening a storm came on suddenly what was the fate of that lone butterfly he died unlike his mates i ween perhaps not sooner or worse crossed and he had felt thought known and seen a larger life and hope though lost far out at sea this is the tale of the winter butterflies in bolinas as told by mary d barber and put into permanent form by paul elder and company under the direction of ricardo j orozco during the month of january of the year nineteen eighteen with decorations by rudolph f shabafer end of winter butterflies in bolinas by mary d barber read for librivox by sue anderson